don't. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the meeting of the Tulare County Board of Supervisors. We will begin today's meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence. We will be led today by Supervisor Dennis Townsend. Thank you, you may be seated. Okay, we're gonna start with our Board of Supervisors matters and we will begin today uh, by going to my right, which is the only way I can go, but it's rare to go to my right and go to Supervisor Valero, who I see frantically writing. So, Supervisor Valero. Okay, I will turn on my mic, it's already on. Good morning to Larry County. Last week and this week have been very busy. We held a town hall in Badger last week. It was well attended with about 25 plus residents. I am very thankful to our staff who carve out time to directly connect with our community members and their concerns. Most concerns dealt with road conditions, the need for plowing during winter months, and additional safety patrol around the mountain community. Self-Help Enterprise ha uh, held a, a very nice ribbon cutting for the Sequoia Commons grand opening, uh, and residents at Sequoia Commons have to be between 30% and 50% of area median income. As mentioned previously, but worth repeating here, is that six of the 66 units are permanent supportive housing for people who have experienced homeless in the past two years. And just to share too, that monthly net rents at the complex range from 331 to 766 and are based on both the unit and resident incomes. There is a great vision and great project happening in the community of Goshen. And I wanna thank colleagues, uh, Supervisor Shucklian and Supervisor Crocker for also attending. I attended the Rotary event last week honoring Mayor Bob Link. Supervisor Shucklian did a great job on the mic roasting her colleague and great laughs throughout the night. <laughs> on Thursday, I was a guest speaker at the Lions Club in Dinuba. It was a great opportunity to listen to their concerns and share my first year journey with them. I want to give a shout out to Supervisor Vanderpool, uh, Jason Britt, and Mike Washam for taking time out of their schedule to meet with Leadership Northern Tulare County. I facilitate year, this year's class, and last Thursday, our day session was on local government with an emphasis on economic development. So the LNTC group uh, were able to learn about growth and development through the lens of the city of Dinuba, the city of Visalia, and Tulare County. I gave the CSAC workshop welcome to a group of about 40 plus participants, mostly from Tulare County, but a few from out of county as well. It's always great to see our staff taking advantage of educational enrichment opportunities to support their profession. And I wanna thank Supervisor Shuckleyan for bringing this opportunity to Tulare County. Uh, many times these workshops are held in bigger communities like Sacramento, San Diego, uh, but our supervisor uh, reached out to uh, CSAC and brought those workshops here. I attended the TCAG meeting in Woodlake yesterday along with my colleagues on this dais. And then this week we have an art selection committee meeting participating in fathering the father, fatherless summit working group. And then I'll be attending the Porterville district office unveiling of the live health online kiosk tomorrow. And then I will then be meeting with Keller Wegley consulting to continue to discuss our Easter row sea water issues. Um, I will be hosting the annual seeds of love event on Thursday, recognizing a few organizations in district four and then on Friday, I will be attending CSET's Youth Development Monthly Meeting to give a welcome and participate in a training. And then in the evening, attending the Young Lives Banquet. For those of you that may not know what Young Lives is, it's an organization that works with teen moms throughout Tulare County. And then lastly, I will be helping out at Fire Station 4 in Cutler um, this Saturday. 
as Tulare County Fire and students participate in a landscaping project to beautify the corner of 63 and Avenue 408. And that is all I have, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's kind of interesting. On the board that I first started uh, working on in uh, 2009, Board of Supervisors Matters typically took the first five minutes of the meeting, but that was all five of us speaking. That was just <laughs> you, Supervisor Valero. Thank you. Um, that, was, that was very thorough. Yeah, I know, I know. That was quite thorough, Eddie. Good job. Um, all right, next we're going to move on to uh, Supervisor Crocker. <coughs> Good. Well, I think past board members weren't as busy as this board is, so I think that's a good testament for the work that's happening uh, with all of us. I want to highlight a couple of things uh, from the past, uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I know I've mentioned uh, town halls that um, I had hosted with, and staff had helped out in Farmersville and Lindsay, and a couple of weeks ago, I uh, wrapped up uh, another town hall in Exeter, and the focus of those three town halls were really around senior centers. And so uh, I really appreciate um, the district attorney's office, uh, health and human services, and specifically adult services, um, as well as um, having uh, code enforcement and, and roads as really a highlight to focus on issues that um, many of our constituents have, but um, specifically services that we have for uh, our seniors in the county. And uh, KT tri AAA, which um, I've previously served on and um, many of my colleagues uh, currently serve on, uh, is something that really helps to provide funding for the senior centers. And so uh, we were able to go out to the three in our district and District 1. Um, and I thought they were all very uh, helpful to the people that attended, and I really appreciate staff for uh, making the time to be able to do that outreach. So thank you for that. Um, also, two weeks ago, uh, the county, we hosted our first, uh, we ha had our first ever Veterans Advisory Committee meeting, and um, it was great to see the individuals that were there. Um, we've got seven uh, members. There's uh, one per district as well as two at-large uh, members that uh, are involved with veterans um, somehow in some capacity, whether uh, an actual veteran or providing services to them. And it was great to just kind of talk about, uh, being that it's a new committee, what the goals and the purposes of the committee were, um, election of officers, trying to uh, facilitate uh, how we move forward, looking at projects and not just talking about um, things, but actually getting some work done and making sure we're providing additional services for our veterans. Um, so I really appreciate staff and I appreciate uh, Health and Human Services Agency again for providing um, that staffing for the committee, for providing an analyst and making sure that um, we're all functioning very well as far as moving forward and making sure that we have a vibrant committee. And uh, I think we have a tentative date next month uh, for our next meeting. So. Uh, more to come on that, but that was uh, it was a good first meeting that we had. Um, this past week, um, Lindsay Hospital District, I attended their board meeting to swear in a new member, uh, Richie Hernandez, um, and uh, that there was a new member there because unfortunately uh, Teresa Hurtado had uh, passed away um, due to cancer, and um, and so it was it was a time that um, Robert, uh, her husband. Um, was able to be honored uh, by that board and then also to, to have a nice uh, young man be able to step up and serve his community uh, in her spot. Uh, last Wednesday, I had the honor of uh, going to Bakersfield. and I know uh, several of my colleagues also went to Bakersfield um, to see President Trump um, and to hear um, what he's doing and his administration on uh, the water issue and the waterfront. Um, as far as advocating and making sure that we're getting more water in our area. Unfortunately, the state of California um, and the Attorney General's office has sued that action, and so that's going to be working through the court system. Um, so there won't be any immediate uh, new water sources until that's resolved in the courts, but the federal government has done their part to try and get additional water uh, for our communities. Last Thursday, uh, the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District had their governing board um, that board meeting, um, the, the item of significance is we put, placed more money into um, an incentive program that helps to reduce uh, ag burning. And so if you want to chip your, uh, your grove, 
Um, you want to chip your orchard and then incorporate those chipping materials, the woody material, into the soil. Uh, there's additional uh, incentives for that. We started that program last year. It's had tremendous success, and um, and so we're we're trying to um, encourage more people to do that so that there's less ag burning and um, doing that in a way that's cost effective to the farmer. So it's actually cheaper to do that than to burn. Um, so it's a benefit for um, all. Um, last Thursday, I also uh, attended the uh, Fresno State Student Union groundbreaking that uh, Linda and Stuart Resnick have uh, contributed $10 million towards building a new student union for Fresno State. And even though it's not in our community, it's, uh, it's hugely important. Most of, our, um, most of our young people go to Fresno State, um, and it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous asset for our region, and it'll help to, to get more people involved, get them more educated, and help us create more jobs uh, for our entire region. Friday, the San Joaquin Valley Insurance Authority, uh, we met. Um, got good updates. We're still tracking in a very good, positive direction as far as uh, insurance authority, and I was honored to be elected as president of that group uh, for the upcoming year. Uh, Saturday, the Exeter Chamber of Commerce hosted their annual dinner, and we had uh, some great awardees um, that we were able to recognize and honor. Um, Monday, yesterday, uh, as Supervisor Valero stated, TCAG had uh, our monthly meeting, and um, there's some great progress on the S Sustainable Corridors Committee um, that's, that's happening that um, some of the staff is, and some of our board members also serve on that, where um, the focus of that, and we're going to be looking at a Measure R amendment to help fund those committees, um, but specifically to clean up our, our highways. That's the, the goal and the purpose. Um, and trying to make sure that um, we look as great as possible for all the visitors, whether they're coming to the World Ag Expo um, that just passed or the two million plus visitors that go up to Skoy National Park. Um, but that we're, we're putting our best foot forward and making sure that um, we have uh, great pride in our communities and, and that our, our roadways and our highways are, are looking pristine like so many other places. And with that, I think I'll... Save the rest for next week. All right. Supervisor Shucklin. On here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> as Supervisor Valero mentioned, I too uh, attended the ribbon cutting for the Sequoia Commons in Goshen and look forward to the uh, next phase of that, another 66 um, units that will be coming online. Uh, I did uh, have the opportunity to roast my former colleague, Mayor Bob Link, so that was a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, last Sunday, or the Sunday before last, I attended the uh, dedication for the uh, private first class Keith Williams Memorial Overpass at, um, if you drive over the overpass there on the 198 at Acres, uh, that has been dedicated to, to Keith, who uh, of course gave the ultimate sacrifice um, during his time in, in Afghanistan. I spoke at the County Center Rotary last Tuesday. I gave an update on all that we are doing in the county, especially uh, highlighting um, all that we are doing uh, for the homelessness situation here. Uh, I then attended the uh, Shaka Moody barbecue that they have every year. And thank you to uh, Under Sheriff Sigley and our Ag Commissioner uh, that gave an update to a lot of the, the walnut farmers that were there. I think they, they appreciate that very much. On Thursday, I was the MC for the Training and Employment Association Conference that was held at the Wyndham. And there was a, a lot of good speakers, including our own Dr. Jason Britt. He hates when I say doctor, that's why I say it. Uh, <laughs> um, today after our meeting, uh, this afternoon, I too will be uh, um, attending our Art Selection Committee meeting. So I look, I look forward to adding some more public art to our space, especially this, the next space will be uh, this one right here that we're in now. I'll then head off this afternoon to my uh, Visalia Property Owners Association meeting. Tomorrow morning, uh, Tulare County Economic Development meeting, and then in the afternoon at 1.30 is our Task Force on Homelessness. Anybody is uh, welcome to attend and hear what's going on there, and we meet uh, just down the street at our Professional Development Center. Friday morning, I will be taking a pre-public tour of Eden House, which is the new 22-bed bridge housing facility 
um, for folks who are homeless or and are in currently uh, some type of case management. That is a collaboration with self-help enterprises, the County of Tulare, the City of Visalia, and the City of Tulare. So um, looking forward to that coming on board. And then I'll be heading um, to Porterville uh, for the memorial service for Captain Ray Figueroa and Firefighter Patrick Jones. And um, I just want to put, put a shout out to um, our Tulare County Fire Department and Chief Norman who have um, endured a lot this last, uh, this last week and, and taking coverage and taking over for um, Porterville. And uh, let's just keep them in our thoughts and prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Townsend. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And good morning. Uh, last, well, back, I guess a week and a half ago or so, on uh, the 13th, I was able to, uh, to meet with uh, Citizens for Energy Independence uh, from Kern County, basically fighting for, uh, uh, against the state, I would say, uh, uh, to keep, uh, keep the oil flowing uh, in, in Kern County. I also learned from, uh, from, from Brandon Alley, who I see her here this morning as well, good morning, uh, also learned that we had a few, we have a few uh, oil wells in, in Tulare County, even in the, in the 5th District of Tulare County, something that I was not aware of. So that was very, a very nice informative uh, time to spend with them and uh, uh, to learn about getting on board and, and helping them because uh, the issues that, that they're having there will affect um, our county, throughout our county and our state. So looking forward to getting on board uh, with that. Um, with those issues. Uh, on the 14th, I uh, gave a welcome to the Farm Worker uh, Resource Fair uh, over in Porterville. That was a really nice time, and uh, I got to share a little bit of my experiences of how, uh, how our family came to, uh, to California and, and what their experiences were, and kind of compare that with uh, what some of the farm workers are experiencing uh, today. And so that was a very interesting uh, morning I got to share. I did it last year as well, and they invited me to come back next year, so I guess that was all okay. And, um, and then uh, on the 14th, I just want, I want to encourage people to go and, and, uh, and have dinner at Fugazi's in Porterville, uh, that's now open at the Old Palace Hotel in, uh, in Porterville. Been there a couple of times, was uh, fortunate enough to go there on, on Valentine's as well. It's wonderful, and uh, please come and support it so it will be there for us whenever we're ready to go up there and have dinner. <laughs> um, on the 18th, um, attended Congressman Nunes's Water Forum uh, in Tulare at the International uh, Agri Center, uh, along with Interior Secretary uh, Bernhardt was also uh, in attendance and, uh, and the CEO of the Friant um, uh, Water Authority. And so that was just learning a little bit more about the, uh, the biological opinion, releasing uh, water uh, south of the Delta, and uh, uh, a little bit of a rally, a little bit of a uh, informational session there in the lead up to the President's visit on, on Wednesday. Of course, later on that evening, as has been mentioned a couple of times, we had the, uh, the devastating uh, library fire in Porterville. Uh, the, the loss of the facility, of course, was, uh, was bad, en bad enough, devastating enough to the community, but then to lose Captain Figueroa and Firefighter Jones was uh, really uh, a heart-wrenching thing for the community. Continues to be as they memorialize uh, uh, those gentlemen this, uh, this week uh, up into uh, Friday. And uh, I too uh, wanted to join. I, I went to the, uh, I went down to the library, and uh, by the time that I got there, of course, much of it was already taken care of. Uh, uh, Chief Norman had called me to let me know because it was in the district uh, that he was on the way over, and that he believed that they believed there was someone trapped in the building at the time that he called, and then he called back to confirm that. And I went down and and uh, and found he and and many of his crews and uh, the sheriff and and deputies uh, down there. Uh, uh, Jason Britt, our CAO, uh, was was down there already, and I had also called Andrew Lockman, our NOES was down there uh, already. So we had a lot of people from Tulare County already mobilized there, um, so much so they had already taken over uh, operations uh, at that point. And I was just very impressed uh, to see uh, see them in action, and not only uh, being very professional and, and taking over uh, that situation, but also the compassion that they showed literally getting down to the point of just going and hugging somebody uh, because there was nothing else to do, uh, you know, at that point in time, which I did a lot of because I couldn't do anything because I was, uh, I was essentially standing around. I was, I was asking uh, Dr. Britt, uh, uh, you know, is there something I should be doing? Uh, do I need to sign something? Do I need to give some sort of permission? She said, no, you know, supervisor, it's all, it's all taken care of. So very impressed with the 
the emergency response, uh, the professionalism, and the compassion uh, of our whole team there. So uh, a big shout out to all of them. So it was a very uh, emotional roller coaster uh, this week because, you know, starting, starting that way and then the very next day be, being invited to, to go to Bakersfield to, to see the president, to watch him uh, sign the record of decision on that biological uh, opinion. So that was a, a very, uh, you know, very much a, an uptime, very much a, an honor uh, to be there. Just an interesting little side note, uh, he invited up onto the stage a young man who's a, a wrestler in Bakersfield, a uh, high school wrestler. Bakersfield always has been sort of a powerhouse in wrestling, and so the young man and his father came up on stage, and when he was done signing the uh, opinion, turned right around and handed it to the young man. And I was very envious because I was a wrestler back <laughs> way back in the day, and uh, that would have been a lot. That would have been really great to receive something from the president of the United States. But uh, I should have wrestled him for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm probably not up to it at this point. <laughs> but uh, on the 20th, uh, as uh, Supervisor Crocker mentioned, we had our Sustainable Corridors uh, meeting uh, for the 65, 99, 198, and 190. Um, and I was railroaded into, I mean, I was elected chair of, the <laughs> of that committee. And so, and, and I am also excited about uh, seeing how that's going to go because it's definitely a committee that is moving forward already. It's not a, a, it's not a meeting just to be a meeting, uh, but we're actually gonna start getting some things done, and that was reiterated yesterday at the, our TCAG meeting. Also that evening, I uh, went to the Lincoln Dinner um, in Tulare at the International Agri Center, um, and on the 21st, the uh, city of Porterville put together a, a memorial uh, for, uh, again, for the firefighters, uh, and many people came out at 414 in Porterville to Centennial Park uh, uh, to memorialize those uh, uh, those firefighters. So that was really a, a something to see. Um, th this week, uh, as uh, Supervisor Valero mentioned, uh, I'll also be attending in Porterville, uh, HHSA, the Live Health Online uh, kiosk uh, kickoff. I'll give a little bit of a, a welcome and a speech there. Uh, and then I have a Man Alive meeting. We have our event coming up at Porterville Nazarene Church, March 14th. Any, anybody that would like to attend. and. Uh, and then, right after that, uh, heading over to uh, give a, a welcome speech for the uh, Portable Unified School District Cross Pathway House uh, Groundbreaking, and that's where all of the pathway programs come together, and they're actually building a home. Uh, my company donated the plans for the home, uh, and they're they're going to uh, they're going to start putting that that home up, and then they sell it to to benefit the uh, the pathways programs in Portable Unified. Um, and then on Thursday is a. a our Government Affairs Committee at Porterville Chamber, uh, and on Friday, uh, the Firefighter Memorial there at Porterville uh, Nazarene Church, and I'm, uh, I'm sure that will be a very fitting tribute. And with that, thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much, Supervisor. Uh, so a couple of uh, public meetings that I wanted to uh, highlight uh, for anyone who's interested in attending. Um, tomorrow at 8.30 at the Tessera Board Chambers, there will be a meeting of the Tulare County Employees Retirement Association Retirement Board at 8.30. Um, in the afternoon in Tulare at the Heritage Complex, there will be a meeting of the International Agri Center Board of Directors at 4 p.m. Uh, I serve on that board as an ex officio member. Um, there will be a first five commission meeting uh, this Thursday at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning right here in these chambers. Um, and then uh, later that evening, I know that we had an agenda item authorizing the expenditure of uh, funds for uh, some refreshments for the individuals in attendance at this event. Uh, County Council will be putting on, I think it's what, Government 110 or something? And we started with Government 101 and tried to name the successive sessions and never seems to work out. But it's a Government 101 forum, and I, I really do want to give ca County Council kudos for um, making that happen. I know that uh, every year that it, it takes place, there's still a packed house uh, full of independently elected board members who serve on special districts throughout this county that really do receive no training uh, in their various positions because their organizations can't typically afford uh, to pay for that training for uh, the various individuals. So um, I think it's a great thing that they put that together and uh, it will be well attended again, I'm sure. Um, that begins at 5 o'clock on Thursday. Um, and then uh, I, too, will be attending the Firefighter Memorial at the uh, Porterville Nazarene Church. Um, and, and I, too, just want to uh, uh, echo the comments of my colleagues uh, in regards to 
um, the firefighters who uh, paid the ultimate sacrifice. You know, I think it's uh, an incredible thing when uh, we can come together as a community to recognize individuals who have paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, for the safety of, of the common man, common woman in this county. And, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, we did lose two of our own, but I think what it showed is uh, how this community truly is a family. Uh, and we can come together and support one another. And I, I just want to thank our fire chief and uh, all of the firefighter personnel from throughout the county, not only the men and women in our department, but from other allied agencies um, throughout the county and even outside of the county. There were uh, firefighters present fighting that fight um, in uh, Porterville. It uh, was, was really incredible. And um, the fact that they would come in and take charge and, and let the Porterville firefighters uh, take care of their own personal difficulties and uh, counseling and um, uh, not having to worry about fighting the fire so that they could grieve uh, because there was so much allied support and uh, uh, interagency cooperation. I think it's, it's pretty amazing. So I want to thank Chief Norman and all the men and women who, uh, thank, thank you, thank you. It's good, good timing for the dog barking. Um, uh, thank all the men and women who uh, risk their lives each and every day, not only in the fire department, but in uh, law enforcement and other uh, agencies uh, to keep us safe. So and I want to thank all of our veterans as well uh, who are out here and uh, the men and women and the armed services for what they do as well. So uh, that's all that I have uh, for uh, Board of Supervisors Matters. And now we will uh, get back to our agenda. But uh, prior to uh, taking up item two, we do have an urgency item. Uh, that I would like to uh, look to council to uh, discuss a process and uh, detail uh, for us on this. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, staff has brought to our attention. Is your microphone uh, on, Dean? It says it's on. Okay, good. Just making sure. <laughs> Mel might have turned uh, your volume down. Uh, staff has brought to uh, our attention that there is an item of some urgency and they would like the board to take action on that. However, the item is not on the agenda. Uh, in order to address it, the board would need to vote um, that the item meets the statutory requirements for an urgency item. The board may then take, um, may add an urgent item to the agenda and then may take action on the underlying item if these conditions are met. First, the board must publicly identify the item and second, the board must vote to add that item to the agenda. In order to add the item to the agenda, the board must find two requirements have been met. One, that there is a need to take immediate action, and two, the need for action came to the attention of the agency after the agenda was posted. The item here is as follows. The agenda for today's meeting was posted on February 20th of 2020, and after the agenda posted on February 21st, the county received notice that a rendering facility used by the county to process livestock carcasses is undergoing an unanticipated temporary closure. The county utilizes the services of Baker's Commodity, a waste management company with a rendering facility in Kerman, California to process livestock carcasses. The Kerman facility is undergoing a temporary maintenance closure and has halted the processing of livestock carcasses. During this temporary maintenance closure, the facility will also be unable to pick up and take in any additional livestock. The closure is expected to last a minimum of seven to 14 days. Action needs to be taken today because the inability to provide for the safe and orderly disposal of livestock carcasses poses a variety of public health risks, including but not limited to vector-borne disease and groundwater contamination. So the board would need to discuss and determine if these conditions have been met and uh, make a motion to add the item to the agenda. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if any of my colleagues remember, but uh, in previous years, especially during the summer when temperatures were uh, above triple digits, uh, we have a tremendous amount of uh, uh, livestock that uh, die in this county and uh, the facility in the past has become overwhelmed and unable to uh, take any additional animal carcasses and what this urgency item allows uh, us to do is uh, for our producers and our livestock uh, handlers throughout the county to dispose of 
uh, animal carcasses and other uh, on-site means such as composting, et cetera. So um, I think that uh, given there's only one plant uh, that accepts carcasses in, uh, I think, in the valley, um, it's a, a significant uh, hardship in the industry, and I think that uh, uh, we have definitely met the need to uh, declare this an emergency and an urgency item. So uh, any other comments uh, from my colleagues? Um, Supervisor Crocker? Uh, yeah, th just that I agree with you uh, full heartedly, and I would move um, to declare that this is an urgency item to place on our agenda. To, to, yes. place, to place the right. item on the agenda. Okay, we have a motion by Supervisor Crocker, second by Supervisor Shucklian, and please vote. Motion passes unanimously. We have added the urgency item to the agenda, um, and then now we have to uh, take up a separate uh, item to declare uh, this item uh, an emergency. So I'd, uh, if, if there isn't any staff comments, there's, I know that the, the dairy industry is, is looking for assistance, and as stated, that we need to be able to provide something uh, very quickly. Um, I think there were, um, from talking with them this morning, uh, there were 11 truckloads that Baker Commodities had to uh, ship to Kettleman City uh, Landfill um, yesterday. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's something that's a, it's a huge significance that's happening right now. So I would move to approve this urgency item. Okay. We have a motion by Supervisor Crocker, second by Supervisor Shuckley, and please vote. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much, board, for uh, entertaining that item. Next, we'll move away from animal carcasses and take up a proclamation honoring the League of Women Voters in its 100th anniversary. I will turn the microphone over to Supervisor Shuckley. Ladies up here. Hi, Miley. How are you? Hi, Dale. What a segue. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my purple? I didn't pick the order of the agenda. Sorry. <laughs> well, let's get it. <laughs> That's all right. I'll go ahead and start. Oh. I won't. Well, first of all, I'd like to uh, honor the League of Women Voters here today to our meeting as we recognize the 100th anniversary of the pa Oh, thank you. Oh, hold on a second. Do I get a tiara, too, or just? No, this is not a tiara thank you. organization. No, it's, I, I know that. I know that. So as we celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment, allowing women to vote in the United States, uh, I'm going to read the... I'm going to read the uh, proclamation first. Uh, Whereas the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization encouraging informed and active participation in government by influencing public policy through education and advocacy. And whereas the League of Women Voters was formed in 1920 as an outgrowth of the movement to give women the right to vote following the passage of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Since its inception, the League has helped millions of women and men become informed participants in government. And whereas in 1952, the Visalia League of Women Voters was officially recognized by the National League, and in 1970, the former name was changed to the League of Women Voters of Tulare County to reflect growing membership drawing from across Tulare County. And whereas today, the League of Women Voters has members in all 50 states and in over 800 communities nationwide. And whereas the League of Women Voters members work diligently to provide services to the public, including high school student voter education programs and voter registration, as well as providing countless college scholarships to local students. Whereas for years, the League has been instrumental in organizing nonpartisan candidate forums in partnership with many community non-governmental organizations as part of their ongoing effort to continually educate the residents of Tulare County. Now therefore be it resolved that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors hereby recognize the centennial of the League of Women Voters and their dedicated work both past and present in addition to their service to the community and the role in engaging voters in democracy. And this is signed by uh, Chairman Vanderpool and myself, 
Supervisor Crocker, Valero, and Townsend. So um, it, it's just hard to believe that uh, women have only been uh, had the right to vote for 100 years in our country when we're almost 250 years old. So uh, thank you to the League of Women Voters for Tulare County for all that you do. Dale, are you the president of the League? Okay, I would like to present this to you, and if you have anything to say, have at it. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it might be another hundred years before you get to say something <laughs> up here, so. I just, I just quickly wanted to uh, let you know, we, we greatly appreciate receiving this proclamation from the county, and wanted to let you know why we're wearing white, and that was to show we meant business, and um, that we we're not um, just any, um, any group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, that's okay. You can wear whatever you want. It's been a hundred years. Oh, okay. Which way? Thank you. And this group means business. All right, thank you very much and congratulations to the League of Women Voters. We will now move on to item three, which is a request to present a proclamation recognizing February 2020 as Black History Month in Tulare County. And to present this proclamation, I will now turn it over to Supervisor Valero. Awesome. As we mark the 44th year of National African American History Month, let us ponder the sacrifices, impacts, and contributions made by generations of African Americans. And let us be steadfast in our stride towards justice and equity. This month and throughout the year, let us think about dreaming, being, thinking, and believing a world that inspires us to love, learn, and lead through the struggles of and triumphs from the African-American community. And with uh, that, I'd like to bring up Brian Thornburn, who um, is the Government Affairs Director for Southern California Edison, um, and also participated in bringing this uh, African-American event to Southern California Edison, but also for Tulare County. And I will read the proclamation as stated. Recognizing the month of February 2020 as Black History Month in Tulare County. Whereas President Gerald Ford officially recognized Black History Month in 1976, he called the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And whereas since then, every American president has designated February as Black History Month. And whereas the President of the United States issued a proclamation honoring the Black History Month 2020 theme as African Americans and the vote. And whereas the 2020 theme coincides with the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which gave African Americans a right to vote. It also is in honor of the centennial anniversary of the 19th century, or 19th Amendment, sorry, which granted women suffrage. And whereas the theme recognizes the fight for equality, representation, and respect that motivates us to continue working for a more promising, peaceful, and hopeful future for every American. And whereas at the local level, Southern California Edison celebrated at the 10th annual Black History Month event, recognizing the organizations and companies who advanced the efforts and contributions of the African American community. And whereas this month we joined the White House in celebrating the cultural heritage, diverse contributions, and unbreakable spirit of African Americans. Now, therefore, be it resolved 
that the Tulare County Board of Supervisors do hereby recognize the month of February 2020 as Black History Month in Tulare County. Signed February 25th, 2020, Chairman Pete Vanderpool, Kyler Crocker, Amy Shucklian, Eddie Valero, and Dennis Townsend. Uh, Supervisor Valero, Chairman Vanderpool, and board members, uh, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Southern California Edison, we appreciate this recognition. Last Friday was our 10th annual uh, Black uh, History Month celebration. We began the event with a moment of silence for the fallen firefighters in Porterville. It was our largest event uh, ever with more than 300 in attendance, and we paid tribute to uh, African-American organizations throughout the region for their community partnership and energy leadership. And it was capped off by an inspiring keynote by Dr. Joseph Jones, uh, who's president of the Fresno Pacific University. So again, on behalf of Southern California Edison, our thanks and our continuing appreciation for the county's support and partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate all the work that Southern California Edison does. Okay, next we're gonna move on and take up item number four, which is a request to recognize Sergeant Patrick Warner upon his retirement from the Tulare County Sheriff's Department for his many years of service. <clears throat> and I, yes. And I will be presenting <clears throat> that plaque, but uh, sh I know Sheriff Boudreaux would like to say a few words, so if you wanna go ahead and come up, Sheriff, and um, say something, then I'll come down and, and give Sergeant Warner his plaque. Sergeant Warner has worked for the county from April 28th, 1986 um, until February 28th, 2020. You couldn't take that leap year day, could you, huh, Sergeant? You just had to, yeah. All right, Sheriff? To the chairman and vice chairman, good afternoon and to the board, or actually good morning. Uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to go sit with Sergeant Warner and his crew, and uh, I've known Patrick a good long time. He's worked for the sheriff's office one year longer than I have. He's been wow. here 34 years. So uh, we've done and had a lot, a lot of opportunities to work with each other through the course of that time, and, and Patrick's always one of those guys that you can put him anywhere at any time, and he performs like a professional, and we're really thankful for him. But one of the things that he said yesterday that I just found so inspiring is that um, in the civil division, you truly, and that's where he's assigned now, you really have to have um, a surgical way of doing things because it's so intricate in his design, um, not only administratively but legally, we have to make sure that someone's in there that really understands and he's done a great job. We've had no complaints in that unit since he's been there, <clears throat> um, being in the civil division with people uh, getting very frustrated uh, in regards to some type of civil action, uh, that's quite the feat. And so what I told him, and I complimented him yesterday, just saying, you know, Patrick, you've done such a great job. I'm really proud of you and all the work that you've done with, with zero <coughs> complaints and, and really moving hard forward in, in such a good, positive work environment. And he says, you know, Sheriff, he says, I love being here, but it's not me, it's my crew. And the first thing he did as the leader was thank his crew and took attention away from himself. And I was just so proud of that. And that really tells the kind of man that he is. The first compliments that he gave was to all of his staff taking that recognition away from him. And because of that, I just felt it important today to be here and to be there here yesterday uh, to recognize him because he's not gonna do it for himself. So compliments to Sergeant Warner and congratulations on your retirement. <clears throat> you back here for some reason. Well, Sergeant, congratulations. And on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, we want to thank you for your uh, dedicated years of service to Tulare County and to the Sheriff's Department. Um, so congratulations. And, you know, I got a sash. I don't know, do I get a badge or anything from you guys? No, no. Can I get the sash? You can have the sash, absolutely. <laughs> so congratulations and thank, thank you me. very much. Would thank you like you. to say anything? Yes. Yeah, cool. You know. Who knew that 40 years ago when you and I worked together that... We did? Yes. <laughs> Sears. 
I was just like five years old. How could I have been <laughs> 40 years ago? <laughs> well, you were, a, you were a young starter. Yes. Who knew we would be standing here? I know. Um, Tulare County has been my home for the last 34 years. It's, uh, I started this with the hopes that I would at least, uh, yeah, I'm going to break up, uh, that I would at least touch the life of at least one person. And if I did that, then I will have been successful. I, I think over the years I've touched more than one. Uh, I want to thank the sheriff and the sheriff's department, especially the board, for uh, allowing me to be here all this time. And uh, on that note, um, I think I'm going to start growing my beard. So, <laughs> What's the thank you. You were in sporting gigs and I was in pain. Oh, very cool. All right, congratulations yeah, again, you. and I think we're going to do the photo op oh, here. Okay. Look, you're retiring and tears are closing. Congratulations, Sergeant, and thank you for your service and best of luck in your retirement. 34 years is one year less than I've been alive. Just yeah, thought I'd make, make, that that, uh, yeah. make that comment, too. Um, congratulations again. All right, now we're going to move on and take up item five on our calendar, which is public comments. Uh, I have a couple of requests in front of me at this time. Uh, first, I have Romelia Castillo. Please come forward and state your name and address for the record. Good morning. My name is Romelia Castillo and I live at 12589 Avenue 416 in Orosi. Thank you for having me here this morning. The reason I am here, I'm here to represent the Western Region of Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall in Dainuba. You know, how many of you have been here since uh, 2010? Okay, you're new. So let me uh, give you a little real fast. In 2010, I came to the Board of Supervisors because I had gone to Washington, D.C. to meet with the President's Cabinet for 10 days, and I happened to, my husband took me to go see the Vietnam Memorial Wall. I had no idea what it was. When I touched that wall, something just went in my soul. And I came back to California, and the wall came to Tulare Veterans Memorial Hall, and I touched the wall, and it's the same thing, feeling came again, so I asked, who brought this wall? And they said, the commander, our president, at that time was Juan Garcia, a big giant, a heart of a man. He gave me all the directions, numbers. And then I brought the wall to the Ledbetter Park in Cutler for six days. It was called the traveling wall. In 2014, the company called me and says, Ms. Castillo, would you like to buy the wall? And I said, how much is the wall? 350,000, that blew me away. 300, there's no way. You did it before, yeah, but it was 12000 for a week. So my husband says, you could do anything you set your mind to. So I'm a member of the Vietnam Veterans of Danuba Post 643. I went to them. They said, go for it. So the American Legion took me under their wings, and we raised the money. We had, uh, we had to raise 177000 We ended up raising 200000 That's what it cost. Last April 30th, we paid the wall off. Right after that, the veterans took the wall down, and now we're beautifying. That's phase two. So what we're doing right now, you have the paperwork that we gave you. A veteran will come and walk you through those pictures. I'm here because we need financial help. In four years, we were able to raise $200,000 to pay the wall. Now we need like $20,000 to finish beautifying it because the cement is very expensive. We did half of the cement, and now we're going to do the other part of the cement, put the artificial grass and the palm trees, and beautify it. This is a legacy for my veterans' friends. I am not a veteran. My brothers were veterans. My sons are veterans. So that's why I'm here today, because it's very important. Some of these men behind me were seniors when they got drafted the day. Some of them were pulled out to go for training the day after graduation. So young, so naive. Back then, kids didn't use guns. 
it was fist fights, now they put guns everywhere. So that's why this has been a goal and a mission that we've had. I started with 12 members in the committee. Right now we have 14. These members, you're gonna see their pictures, they've been working very hard digging. And these veterans run from 70 to 84 years old because we have no money to pay a contractor. Although we have a contractor that's showing them what to do step by step with no charge. So I'm here to ask the five of you, not just Eddie Valero, who said he's gonna give us the money from the good works, but I'm asking all of you five to donate money. The past supervisors donated on 2010 when I brought the wall to Ledbetter Park. On 2014, I came before the board then, and they donated money for the wall that we paid off now. And today I'm here with the delegate of veterans to ask financial help and support so we could complete this beautification on phase two. And I know that the beautification of money for good works is for education and health. Well, you know, phase three is gonna be about educating our youth what the Vietnam War was, because those are the grandparents of the kids now, and that is very important. And I'm not ashamed here to come and ask you for that financial support. And I'm gonna ask Ray Quintana to come up and put, walk you through the pictures that you're gonna be seeing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. Wow, she took away everything I was gonna say. <laughs> well, anyways, my name is Ray Quintana. Thank you very much for having me here today. And I'm a, a committee member of the wall. And right now, we're in our, our second phase, as Romeda said. And uh, I have a portfolio here of some of the work that we've been doing. You know, we've been out there working hard, you know, and for 70 to 80 year old guys, you know, we're still, we're still chucking out there. But anyways, uh, we're here for your support and supporting our veterans, you know. We, uh, I was 18 years old when I was in Vietnam. I did two tours there and I'm proud to be a Vietnam veteran. And uh, my fellow vets here that have come here to support us, uh, I thank them for being here, and I thank you, uh, supervisors, for hearing me out today. And uh, we, we, we desperately need your support to finish our project, our mission that we've uh, done for four years now. We meet every Monday, and uh, we've been working on the wall every uh, three or four days a week, you know, uh, it's a lot of work, but uh, you know, it's something that we want to do and we love and we, we want to honor our fellow brothers and sisters that didn't, that paid the ultimate price and didn't make it home. And uh, so I'm asking you step up, uh, step up to the plate and uh, be there for us, for us veterans and all the veterans in the future. And I uh, want to thank you very, very, very much. We're, anyways, we're about $20,000 short uh, to complete our goal, and it's gonna be a historical event for Tulare County. You know, it's the only wall in, in the western part of the United States, a permanent wall, and this wall is here there to educate, to heal, and, and, to, and for those who can't make it to Washington, D.C., they can come to Dinuba and see the beautiful wall there. I mean, it's gonna look beautiful. We already have, it's gonna be raised two feet off the ground in the foundation. I mean, it's gonna be first class and we're, we're proud to have it here in, in Dinuba and Tulare County. So Tulare County can be proud to have the, the, this wall, the only wall in the western part of the United States. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it, thank you. I have a request from Mary Bryant. State your name and address for the record. Thank you. Mary Bryant, the Real Mooney Grove Project Incorporated. I'm at 1920 uh, South Tipton Avenue here in Visalia. Um, on behalf of the Board of Directors, I just wanted to let you know kind of what we are working on for the park. Um, as you go, I'm here, Mooney Grove is our number one priority. Cutler Park is going to be number two. Cutler Park is a horrible mess also. Anyway, what we've been working on, we've already taken over maintenance of the Veterans Memorial at Mooney Grove um, on a weekly basis. 
Um, we've attended the Park Advisory Committee, um, and we are working on coming up with um, an idea that is consistent with other parks that have ponds and lagoons for um, a series of water waterfall type um, system that's going to go on the islands out on the park just to keep the water clean. Um, and Roading Park, other places like this have um, systems like this. Um, we're working on, um, of course, low um, cost effective and low maintenance is what we're working on. And then stuff that's not going to have to uh, take a lot of time and a lot of money. So the lagoon absolutely is going to have to be drained it's, and cleaned out. It's been 20 years since it's been done. It used to be done about every five years. Um, the water is bad. It smells. I've been there several times in the last um, several weeks to take measurements for what we are working on. Um, the ghost poop is just horrible. I don't know what the park workers are doing. I'm not here to focus on that today, but I hear all the complaints too. The goose poop, the, the lagoon's got to be done, okay, and uh, within the next year or so, I would say. Um, we have identified six major sites on the sidewalks around the lagoon that um, is a safety hazard. These are major, major things at Mooney Grove. Um, we went out over the weekend to take measurements. Some of the sections we're going to have to either rip out or fill in are 31 feet long around the lagoon. Um, this has got to be done. It's got to be done. So um, we're working on perhaps bringing Symphony back to the park. Um, on the North Island, there is electrical outlets, so we may be able to um, um, get something going on there to bring people back to the park, to make it Mooney Grove to where it's functioning and, uh, and profitable. Um, we're also going to be submitting to the Parks Advisory Committee our recommendation for repairs for the bridge. The bridge is in bad condition, too. Um, it needs to be painted. This is the 100th anniversary of the bridge at the park. So um, we, want to, we want to get that done before the end of the year and have maybe another rededication ceremony for the bridge. And to honor, and it was a veteran who did design, came home from World War I. His first job with Tulare County was designing the bridge at Mooney Grove. So, um, and to honor him and the veterans, we want to get it fixed this year to honor the 100th anniversary, okay? Um, um, we want to get started on doing some stuff also at Cutler Park. Um, we, have, our, we have requested a special Parks Advisory Committee meeting to push some of these things through because we can't wait four months for the Parks Advisory Committee. We want to get going on this stuff now. We requested three weeks ago a, a rowboat Go over to the islands, we've got to take some measurements. We've got to see if that electrical over there is working. Uh, we still don't have approval for that. We don't have approval for that yet. Um, we haven't gotten approval yet to have a special parks advisory committee. We want to start pushing these things through a little bit um, faster. So um, with that being said, I'm having an event out at the park, Easter Sunday. We're going to have a barbecue. We're recreating um, what happened April the 12th, the same exact date in 1936. They had a, um, a uh, uh, sunrise Easter service. They had egg hunts for the kids. They had 5,000 kids show up. Hopefully we won't have that many show up. Um, and um, so I invite, invite you all to come and we just kind of wanted to let you know what's going on. Um, once again, we, um, we need something done with the park workers at the park. The park, the poop has to be cleaned off. I've been over out there several times last week. It hasn't been cleaned at all. And it's supposed to be done every day. There was trash. There was plastic bottles in the Can lagoon. you please wrap it up, Mary? Out. I've given you an extra minute. Would you wrap it up? Oh, I'm please? sorry. Thank you. I, I know uh, Supervisor Shuckley had a comment uh, as well uh, from okay. uh, Parks Advisory. Yeah, members. just from the Parks Advisory Committee, you mentioned about the sidewalks. We're cur I think you were at that meeting when we talked about we are cur currently waiting to hear um, about a grant uh, that we applied for, a non-competitive grant, um, and that is going to be the focus of those that funding is to fix that pathway around the lagoon and we've also been in talks uh, for quite some time and have a tentative date I don't want to share just yet for the symphony to be doing something out at the okay. park so yeah okay we got yeah, a lot going on is, they should be out there cleaning the go back and now. forth if you want to talk to her afterwards you can yes. thank you thank you appreciate it um, are there any additional public comments this morning okay seeing none I will close the public comment period uh, we do have uh, 9.30 timed items, but I would like uh, to take up the consent calendar real quick so that our various departments can get back to uh, their work uh, if they would like. Uh, any uh, issues or items for correction to be pulled from consent from board members? Members of the public? All right, seeing none, uh, I will entertain a motion. All right, I have a motion from Supervisor Shuckley. 
A second by Supervisor Townsend. Please vote. Consent calendar passes unanimously. Thank you very much. We will now uh, take up our 9.30 timed item. Um, item number six is a public hearing, a request from the Resource Management Agency to deny the appeal filed by uh, Juliana Seligman uh, et al. Mr. Bach. Chairman Vanderpool. You should get your doctorate so I can call you Dr. Bach. Uh, no, I'm good. I, I can't take on any more debt. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman Vanderpool, Supervisors, uh, Dr. Britt, uh, Dan Peterson, County Council. I am Aaron Bach. I am the Assistant Director of the Resource Management Agency. And before you today is the appeal of a special use permit, uh, PSP 19-019 Redwood Ranch. Uh, it's for assemblages and guest ranch. And I am going to quickly hand out two letters we received at uh, 2.30 this morning to make sure the record is uh, complete. There you go. So uh, by way of over overview, the property is located at 48808 South Fork Drive, approximately eight miles east of Three Rivers, and outside the Three Rivers Urban Development Boundary on a uh, 2.5 acre, uh, <coughs> includes constructed facilities on a 190 acre property. The request is by the Redwood Ranch, and it's for the assemblages of people use permit for a wedding venue, a guest ranch, and private campground. It contains a 2,184 square foot barn that was permitted and legally converted to a residence and is currently being used as a vacation rental subject to TOT. For the owner's non-commercial use, there are three uh, 368 foot square cabins and two single family residences. Uh, PSP 19-019 uh, was approved by the Planning Commission through Resolution 9691, which limits Redwood Ranch's assemblages of people to 12 weekend events per year and a maximum of 250 attendees. Uh, two employees work on the site. A ranch manager is present on the site during events and is available by phone. And events take place primarily on weekends between 10 and 11. There are over 70 conditions that have been included for this project. And the appellants are appealing on the application of the use within the foothold growth management plan under the AF zone and the categorical exemption. So as you can see from this map, it's over eight miles away from the uh, edge of the Three Rivers community. Uh, it's on a 190 acre uh, property. Um, <clears throat> this was a Google shot, so you can see the distance from other residences, and there was uh, brought up at the last minute the Planning Commission, uh, the Cahuilla Verdea Preserve, which is across the roadway, um, which is about 0.15 miles away. So all of these things are a little bit of a distance away, and all the assemblage ordinance requires is a 300-foot buffer from the property line in order to minimize impacts. You can see both up and down uh, the um, valley there that there are obstructions to a lot of the views into the site that was mentioned by some of the letters. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, we received the letters regardless, but again, the 300 foot buffer is a requirement from the ordinance. And so there are existing facilities. All these facilities exist. They're not asking to expand any of the facilities. You can see that it meets the 300 foot setback. Uh, the project includes a domestic hard rock water well existing, five fire suppression water storage tanks existing, two fire hydrants, laundry room, shop building, two septic leach line systems, two propane tanks. There's parking areas for 35 vehicles or 50 if LAs are hired. Uh, Redwood Ranch has six guest rooms and one residence, barn house, and up to 100 overnight guests would be allowed uh, with the use permit, uh, 20 inside the barn 80, with 80 campers. Uh, and this project has not been uh, publicized as a public camp campground, uh, so it's all affiliated with the venue. Uh, portable toilets would be brought in for more than 25 overnight guests or assemblage attendees. And I also want to mention if there are uh, 100 um, uh, attendees that they use shuttles to keep that, that uh, trip count down. So here's some uh, views of the site. Um, as you can see, the uh, <clears throat> the um, entryway is not heavily lighted. Uh, the barn and the general events are, are held uh, way outside of that 300-foot buffer. 
And uh, generally from what we've seen, um, as far as the uh, average events in the lighting um, is not outside of the allowances of our use permit requirements. Here are more side photos. This is where the fire pit was located. As you can see, it's uh, centrally located and surrounded by gravel. Uh, so the Planning Commission decision occurred on December 11, 2019. Uh, they approved the Redwood Ranch use permit, adding findings and conditions, uh, including limiting noise to 60 dBs, our standard is 65, and that was actually offered by the applicant, uh, avoiding any potential, and that's at the property line, avoiding any potential ground disturbance impacts by requiring camping only in the parking area, limiting events to between 10 and 11, uh, giving RMA a calendar of events for the year, requiring posting of events to the neighbor and RMA 10 days prior to each event, allowing RMA on site to inspect events as they occur, uh, requiring a fire department safety and evacuation plan, uh, require, say a fire department approved safety and evacuation plan, requiring cultural, if there is any ground disturbance, and biological surveys to be conducted before the first 2020 event, and finding that the permit is only for these 12 events and do not consider any additional events under this use permit. <clears throat> uh, furthermore, the events will not create car trips during, uh, during peak hours that exceed the county 100 trip thresholds. A shuttle service is required for weddings with more than 100 invited guests to reduce trips on South Fork Drive. The site is within the state responsibility area that was noted in the findings of the uh, staff report and the use permit itself. Uh, open wood fueled fire areas are allowed only in the county inspected fire pit in the center of the gravel parking lot in months with low fire risks and not during the Cal Fire declared fire season, whichever is longer. The county fire department advised Redwood Ranch on fire safety and emergency evacuation plans uh, at the inception of this project and the existing and future septic systems are subject to the local agency management program as a approved by this Board of Supervisors. <clears throat> so there were some questions about general plan and zoning consistency, uh, what the foothill growth management actually says. The subject site is located outside any urban development boundary and is subject to the foothill growth management plan where applicable with, land, with a land use designation of foothill agriculture. To be clear, the development corridor guidelines were used for the creation of development corridors not to regulate use permits in the FGMP. The FGMP and the general plan allow a guest ranch or summer camps and an assemblage of persons for educational and entertainment purposes with a conditionally approved special use permit. Section 10.3 is very clear. AF zone states use permits allow guest ranches as well as camping, lodging, and asphalt batch plants in the AF zone is clearly uh, within the designation of agriculture, foothill agriculture. Section 16, our special use permits section, clearly says assemblages of people for entertainment purposes in the AF zone and other agricultural zones shall include but shall not be limited to agritourism, company retreats and picnics, and special events or celebrations such as weddings. The zoning ordinance is very clear. <clears throat> and there's some other definitions that raise some questions by people in opposition to this project. Other general plan policies that are relevant uh, and do include economic development element policies. Uh, the county shall support the development of visitor serving attractions, the development of recreational activities. <clears throat> that includes the development of recreational activities along the Kauia River. Uh, ERM uh, 5.9 encourages private interest to establish new commercial recreational opportunities such as destination resorts which would be much greater and grander than a simple use permit. Uh, <clears throat> land use element policy LU 4.4, travel oriented tourist commercial uses provides exceptions for resort or retreat related developments. And I do want to distinguish this is not a resort, but would be more in line with the retreat related developments. Section 10.3 D8, uh, guest ranch or summer camp are permitted less intensive uses uh, <clears throat> More intensive permitted uses are listed under Section D under 10.3 uh, than guest ranches, but uh, as far as guest ranches are defined as buildings and premises offering recreational facilities for such pursuits as horseback riding, 
swimming and hiking with living and dining accommodations. All that clearly, clearly is spelled out as for this use permit. The county met its burden in addressing the special use permits because section 16B has its own board approved ordinance 3416, which includes conditions that were used for this project. Um, in addition, the planning commission and staff has added conditions to this project based on the letters in opposition to the project. So that, um, but the ordinance itself and with the planning commission requirements uh, is clearly uh, consistent with the general plan and zoning and for the health, safety and welfare considerations of the county. So under CEQA, um, the opposition is also questioning the categorical exemption. So some of the findings for the categorical exemption were it did not exceed our 100 uh, peak trip threshold of our general plan uh, because there was about seven to eight peak uh, hour trips. Uh, most trips take place on weekends before 10 and after 10, which are not peak traffic hours. A condition of approval required shuttle service for events with more than 100 invited guests, which greatly limits the peak vehicle trips per event. Uh, the California Historical Resource Information System, uh, we look at for these projects, um, and it's date, the actual research was conducted on July 23, 2019. Uh, the results letter stated there have been no previous cultural resources studies conducted within the project area, and no recorded cultural resources. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife, Cahuilla Brodia Ecological Preserve, is located north of the project and approximately 1,000 feet from any active area of the site. No additional construction is allowed by this use permit. Camping is regulated to the parking area. Furthermore, under CEQA, the Planning Commission found the project will not have a significant effect on the environment as an existing assemblages and guest ranch facility and has been determined to be a categorically exempt because the activity will have no increase to the existing CEQA baseline. Um, which is consistent with CEQA for Section 15301 Class 1 existing facilities. The project description is accurate and no new construction is being proposed. There is no piecemealing and there are no future additional events suggested as part of the project because a previous proposed variance has been withdrawn. As such, it is not considered part of the proposed project. There are no cumulative impacts as another project in the area does not create a cumulative effect by itself and just because it exists. And any surrounding activities do not exceed any CEQA thresholds of significance, hence the project qualifies, again, for a class one categorical exemption. The project will not result in significant impacts and will not require additional public services or mitigation measures. There are more than 70 conditions of approvals that would apply to this project that would avoid, minimize, or eliminate potential impacts below thresholds of significant and most have been added just because of the neighbor's concerns. <clears throat> in a response to the appellants, that was the Planning Commission's findings, in response to the appellants themselves, um, the Planning Commission has consistently followed the board's guidance in approving assemblages under ordinance number 3416 throughout the county. The board found the ordinance consistent with the AF zone and general plan FGMP when adopted in 2010. The board only made considerations for RVLP and not FGMP in that ordinance, i.e. the one of these types of events in the foothills. Section 10.3 and section 16B both allow both guest ranches and assemblages in the AF zone with approved use permits. Uh, in regards to zoning, uh, they did bring up the general plan under the heading of zoning. Was uh, policy 4.B.2 was a policy to require noise studies and noise parameters for CNEL, which is a noise study over a 24 hour period, looking at average um, DBs for large scale projects, i.e. for new freeways, airports, industrial facilities. The assemblages ordinances 65 DBA at property line itself was a form of implementation of this overall overarching general plan policy. The use permit meets the minimum acreage of 40, minimum acreage requirements of 40 acres as 190 acre property. The enforcement policies were also a question. RMA a has consistently enforced its ordinances where it sees a violation of the law that results in harm to health and safety. No conclusive evidence of harm uh, were found uh, by any of the reports 
and as far as the noise or traffic or the events themselves as the fire inspectors and sheriffs did not document any violations. <clears throat> so we are consistent in our enforcement policies across the county. Uh, per county ordinance number 3493, the planning director has the discretion to immediately abate a violation that creates an immediate danger to the health and safety of persons or property. Again, we did not find any uh, in the record. <clears throat> and uh, since we did the uh, temporary permits, um, none have been verified or documented as a single violation. The evidence provided consists of no expert evidence so far. An attorney is not an expert in regards to noise or traffic, and their evidence consists of mostly downloaded individual users or the facility's Facebook posts. That's pretty much tantamount to all the evidence that was provided on the, uh, the Facebook posts. Under the temporary permit uh, for Woodward Ranch, the county staff has been monitoring. The site has not been found to be in violation of any of its conditions. Uh, with monitoring and compliance, with the monitoring and compliance plan for the Redwood Ranch, as uh, we collaborated and worked through with the Planning Commission with a calendar and 10 days notice, plus RMA inspections of the events, the adequacy of the performance of the conditions can be monitored for their sufficiency, and this is very similar to what we did with the Lions Club, and that has worked out very, very well so far. <clears throat> So then there was uh, some questions about some interactions between the county staff, uh, fire department, and the applicant um, as far as false claims or prejudicial error in the Planning Commission findings. The staff has met previously with the fire inspector, John Meyer of the Tulare County Fire Department, and discussed the project and corroborated with Mr. Cantarozzi's, the project managers. Uh, so they had some preliminary uh, discussions about what they should do for fire. Um, as the project was just getting started. Um, first of all, this conversation is memorialized in the findings 41 and 42 of the Planning Commission's resolution and conditions of approval, 23 of the PC resolution. So not only was that discussion had, it was memorialized in our Planning Commission findings. The fire department recommendations are typically standard and are part of the record as conditions of approval 19 through 27 in the resolution. So that discussion with John Meyer was addition, in addition to uh, standard conditions. Uh, the fire department recognizes the subject site is in the state responsibility area in a very high fire severity zone as finding uh, 41 and condition of approval number 24. The CAO, the conditions of approvals includes annual fire department inspections under condition of approval number 19. Uh, this is not considered a development under the local hazard mitigation plan. Uh, so the levels one through four on the FGMP response times were for the development corridors themselves and their locations, not for every project uh, in the county and are relevant and inapplicable to this use permit. Uh, the record reflects that there are findings in the staff report and resolution that show enough substantial evidence of the conversion metrics, zoning standards, and rectification of the disparity between the resolution, the ordinance, and the note that Mr. Myers uh, was said to have made to Mr. Cantarosi's field observations to justify allowing up to 250 people, even if the note suggested only 150. The fire department did not require limiting the project in any of their standard conditions. So then there's a question about the accurate project description. Um, the accurate project description is not what is in the application. It is the project does change through the time of the application to the time of the Planning Commission's decision. In fact, we're making conditions up to the very end in defining the project, and all it did was limit the project. It didn't expand upon it. So there was also a question about, you know, enough time to look at the project. Well, the project didn't really change uh, from the time the 10-day uh, notice went out of the Planning Commission hearing. That's usually what the project did, uh, not, not necessarily what's in the application, especially for CEQA purposes. Uh, CEQA requires that the CEQA document consider the whole of the project that was processed and approved by the Planning Commission. The project is as accurately described in the resolution as made by the conditions and findings by staff and the Planning Commission. The general plan, the 24 average uh, DBA or CNEL analysis is not required 
for assemblages as discussed. There was a question again about the project's accurateness. Is the general plan policy required a CNEO? Again, that's for freeways, airports, et cetera, not for assemblages. The project is whole if there is no outstanding parts. More, it's more, it has to be more than a mere thought to be a project. Um, so there are no future phases or subsequent approvals as part of this approval for the PSP 19-019, as there is no application or staff processing of a potential future project being reviewed at this time. There is an existing facility. The existing facility rule does apply, section 15301 exemption. There is no substantial evidence put in the record by appellant to contradict this fact. Without verification of proof of expertise or verification of any unusual circumstances received in testimony that were different from any other existing wedding venues in the county or any expert evidence showing unusual impacts, the record shows the existing facility rule is not upset by the unusual circumstances. And I would want to enter into the record at this point. Uh, appellant's attorney, um, and basically uh, they, it was a traffic report uh, done by an engineer who did look at the uh, safety uh, concerns of the appellant. Uh, obviously they used, uh, pic there was no graphic representations of what they used for pictures or videos or anything. So I, it was suggested that they did use some of our planning commission documentation as far as the width of the roadway with right outside the roadway is up to 14 feet. Um, and then it brought up the whole issue of line of sight. Uh, line of sight itself, um, as you can see from a map I, I made there, at the project entry is over 300 feet one way and probably upwards 400, 500 feet going the other way. But they did bring up line of sight along that whole roadway um, as an issue that didn't meet our county standards. Uh, so that, that was the whole of the argument. Outside of that, they brought up that uh, um, because of the unusual amount of uh, traffic on this project that they would uh, suggest a traffic study. Again, they didn't bring up our 100 trip thresholds or the fact that uh, we did look through at what the trip would, would be generated from this project or the conditions we put upon the project. So as a, a little cursory in the analysis, um, we do not believe that creates any fair argument at this time um, without more. Uh, there are no cumulative impacts from two use permits, as we said before, just because there's evidence of another project. If that project itself didn't exceed any thresholds and jointly does not exceed any thresholds with this project, there is no secondary project for a cumulative analysis. There's no significant adverse impact because there was no unusual circumstances. Again, there's many variations on the same arguments used by appellant and we answered them all. Uh, the fire safety zone is consistent across the area for the existing uses and it's not an unusual factor. The county has several assemblages in the Williamson Act lands. The subject property is still being used for animal Husbandry, again, not an unusual circumstance. The Environmental Health Division found the septic tank compatible with the use, so this is not an unusual circumstance. There is and there continues to be no fair argument made, as stated before, uh, because of the potential for fire and tra traffic safety, as highlighted in my response to that letter, uh, without any facts associated with the testimony. Staff considers evidence as represented by CEQA's guidance. None of the CEQA resource thresholds of significance were even approached by this project, much less enough for anyone to raise a fair argument or to require an environmental impact report. Substantial evidence shall include facts, reasonable assumptions predicated upon fact, and expert opinions supported by fact. Again, the expert opinion of that engineer, in our opinion, is not supported by fact. No mitigation required because no significant impacts. The standard conditions avoid impacts. Added conditions or measures or non-standard conditions are compromises for the benefit of the community are not nor should be construed to be mitigation. I wanna make that point one more time. We added conditions because of the neighbor's concerns, not necessarily to reduce impacts. Incidentally, it does. Regardless, there's no uh, significant impacts that require mitigation.
So this is the affirmative statement of due process of law, not abridging constitutional property rights, concurrence of the use of the Planning Commission's police powers and procedural adequacy. Um, I could read this to you, but I think it's also in the document. So it's uh, the board affirmatively, affirmatively states that the project is compliant with the county's general plan. The board states the boards and planning commission's land use authority and responsibilities are fully utilized. Um, I'll skip down here a little bit. The board states that the project is in compliance of all the general plan and zoning code and procedural policies as stated in the staff report planning commission resolution and the board's findings. These include all the policies under the 2012 general plan, special use permit for an assemblage of persons and associated guest ranch for short-term rental and on-site venue camping, and as in provided in section 10.316V of said ordinance number 352, and as provided in section 65905 of the government code of the state of California, and the code enforcement policies and procedures of Tulare County. That concludes staff's uh, presentation. Um, if you have any questions for me or other staff who are here, uh, we are definitely here to answer. Otherwise, it, the applicant and the uh, appellant, uh, the attorney, looks like they are present. Thank you for that presentation, Aaron. That was almost as long as Board of Supervisors matters. Um, <laughs> any uh, questions for staff from board members? Supervisor Townsend. Oops. There it is. Okay. Aaron, um, in looking through the, there was uh, 70 some odd conditions um, and noise was mentioned uh, that there was a condition of 60 decibels at the property. And also there was a, I noticed that some of the, some of the comments were uh, amplified music, uh, you know, past midnight, things like that. I noticed one of the conditions was uh, hours of operation 10 a.m. till 11 p.m. Uh, question, is that only on weekends? Is there a different time for weekdays like there are in some of our use permits? Uh, that, uh, no, R really there wasn't a differentiation uh, for the actual assemblage events. Um, we did not make that uh, delineation in this case, so. And is that is that based on the fact there's just 12 events per year? So yes. you're kind of assuming those are weekends? Yes, and sometimes the Planning Commission will uh, change that up a little bit, especially if you start looking at our uh, agricultural services and our uh, contractor storage yards. We start using that uh, guidance for weekends versus uh, weekdays, but in this case it was pretty, uh, especially since the noise is gonna be regulated at 60 dB. Um, it's not really a big, big issue, we don't think. Okay, and, uh, and the second one was just about light shielding. I noticed there was quite a few uh, comments about uh, the lights upward uh, facing lights. The pictures seem to be more of the the garden kind of lights and things like that, uh, but there were a lot of comments on uh, upward facing lights, uh, kind of implying floodlights lighting up the sides of the hills and things like that with the uh, impacting dark sky. Uh, any comments on, on that as the conditions read? Well, again, uh, the, the pictures were pre-use uh, permit and then there's post-use permit. And once the use permit gets in, uh, is in effect, we'll, we will be able to regulate that better. Um, the dark sky didn't look like it was, uh, um, again, it's not a, a, a law in this county to have those dark sky protections. And we are just borrowing from the Three Rivers Community Plan when we discuss those things. But the uh, use permit itself will protect the dark sky. Uh, it's hard to tell from the pictures how, uh, how much the dark sky was upset by those pictures themselves, but um, in the future, the light will be shielded, shielded downwards and it will be made not to project upwards. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, any other uh, questions uh, from board members? Okay, uh, seeing no further questions at this time, I would like to invite the appellant, Ms. Seligman, or her representative to present her appeal. Um, if you would keep your presentation to 15 minutes or less, it'd be appreciated. Good morning. I will try to keep my presentation to 15 minutes, but I cannot promise that I will do that. Uh, Again, good morning to the Board of Supervisors. My name is Dennis Villavicencio. I'm representing Ms. Seligman in this case. 
Uh, neither she nor her husband could be here today. He just had a recent surgery, and he's uh, had some complications from that, and they apologize for their inability to both of them be here. Um, as I told you previously, uh, for 13 years I owned and operated a lodge and an inn at the entrance to Sequoia National Park, the Buckeye Tree Lodge in the Sequoia Village Inn. I have quite an extensive amount of experience in running hotels, inns, lodges, vacation rentals, et cetera. I own vacation rentals. I have managed them. I have written contracts for them. It, it's uh, fairly extensive. I have also served as, for the last 12, over 12 years, as a paid call firefighter with Tulare County. Uh, I am not here in that role, so I want to be very clear about that. I am here as the attorney for the Seligmans, not as a county employee or as a county firefighter. Um, <coughs> I, I want to reiterate the fact that uh, the Seligmans are not here because they're opposed to the, the Redwood Ranch as a vacation rental, much as any of the other vacation rentals in town. They're not opposed to that at all. They're very, there were very few impacts and there were no complaints ever when it was operated as strictly a vacation rental. Um, there's no worry about competition as well. This is a, a uh, competition issue. We've heard this, this uh, raised by the parties, but the reality is the, the Seligmans operate their own vacation rental, but it's a small unit that sleeps no more than four people. They're not in competition with the six bedroom house, uh, which is Redwood Ranch. The issue really for the Seligmans and many of the other folks that you may hear from and that have, we've uh, dealt with in the complaints and at the planning commission level is not at all with the vacation rental aspect. It is with the destruction of the peace and quiet, the tranquil nature, the dark skies that uh, has occurred at the end of South Fork. At the planning commission, we heard some of the, the kids that live nearby there talk about that rather than hearing the owls and the frogs at night, what did they hear? YMCA, you know, blaring to them on, on the uh, stereo system. Uh, that's not something that anybody wants to hear when you're a resident and you, you live up, out in the country. Frankly, I don't think it's something somebody wants to hear if you live in the city either, but that's just my own personal thing. Um, we're also concerned about the substantial impacts to the environment, the sub the significant increase of the traffic on a very substandard road for this type of commercial venture, the elevated fire risk to the community, and the risk of hundreds of party guests being trapped as, uh, on a one-way, one-way out, one-way in, narrow, winding mountain road. Folks, the reality of this is that this is a financially driven project, plain and simple. Let's look at the numbers. According to Redwood Ranch's own website, the minimum fees for up to 25 guests for a venue fee is $4,000 plus a $250 cleaning fee, plus the rental on the house, which is required, another $900 per night with a two-night minimum, plus additional fees. At the very least, a two-night stay with a, for the smallest party at the Redwood Ranch venue will deposit $6,400 into the Redwood Ranch bank account. On the other hand, uh, it, if it's a large party, as many of the South Fork folks have had to endure, the, a, according to their website, a, uh, a party of over 200 guests, which is allowed under what, what they're seeking, will provide a $14,000 venue fee, a, a $700 cleaning fee, $1,800 rental for the barn, $350 in cleaning fees, plus if they have campers, the 80 campers they're, they're requesting, that's another $4,000, a two-day total of $20,850. Folks, this is not a benevolent uh, gift to the community of, of, gosh, let's bring people up here to enjoy the peace and quiet. This, this is a profitable endeavor. This is a business deal. So <clears throat> I, I want to reiterate, though, that this business deal comes at the price. It comes at a price for the residents and the neighbors that live up there. They're the ones that are going to pay the price for this. Now, according to Redwood Ranch's own words, uh, their wedding venue has been part of the industry since 2015, which is right after the Georgia's purchased property in 2014. By 2016, they were touting themselves as one of California's top outdoor wedding ceremony and wedding reception venues. But Redwood Ranch never sought a permit from the county. They never sought to go and talk to all their neighbors and, and ask them or 
talk to them about what they were doing, and they just kept growing this business, this wedding and party venue, until it became too much for everybody to handle. Now, the neighbors initially did not complain about the occasional, but as this grew into the, the large endeavor, obviously they became very concerned. Massive traffic, uh, people honking horns in the middle of the night, listening to YMCA. You know, it, it, in, in those canyons, a lot of times the noise travels a little bit differently than it might in the city. Uh, it travels a long distance, and it might, you might not hear it a half mile away, but you might hear it two miles away. That's the nature of the rocks in the canyons. Um, I put together and submitted to RMA a uh, very extensive brief that documented a lot of the problems and the issues, and it, it, it's not just uh, Facebook posts. What they are, are they are pictures and documents from Redwood Ranch's own websites. They're pictures and documents from the clients and the people that were there, and they show the extent, the significant extent of the partying. The partying that included not just Let's go, you know, have fun at a wedding. They included parties with uh, THC and cannabis-infused uh, goodies and warnings to parents about keeping your kid, you know, keep watching your kids because these things were going to be out for everybody. You know, trays of, of, of 30 to 60 Jaeger shots at a time being handed out. Now, I'm not against a good party. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I. You know, we all enjoy that. But uh, by 2019, the uh, Redwood Ranch was certainly aware of all of the issues and the, the parties and, and the complaints and the, the unhappiness of their neighbors. <coughs> I, I've heard uh, Mr. Bach state repeatedly, both at the Planning Commission and here, that there were no substantiated complaints. But the reality is, uh, the Sheriff's Department on one occasion in July of 2019, July 19th, went out to investigate a noise complaint. And when the deputy arrived at midnight, he heard no music, he spoke to the property renter. She advised that they were just playing music and they had, that they had been playing music and they had just stopped 20 minutes earlier. That is a substantiated complaint, folks. She admitted that, that they were playing the music and, and that it was loud, but they had just turned it off. And so obviously at that point, you know, he had nothing else to do. But the, the irony of this report, this was just this last year, is in, in July of 2019, July 19th of 2019, in the middle of the summer, when the deputy went to leave, he proceeded to drive out of the gravel driveway, and you know what he accidentally ran over? A fire pit. A fire pit. In July, in the middle of the summer, Folks have a fire pit. They're using a fire pit. And, you know, we've heard about the, the concern and that they're, they're going to be very careful about fire. But the reality is there was no caretaker or manager there. It was just people partying at midnight with a fire pit, and they just turned off the noise, the, 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 the music. One of the, the big issues in, in this case is the inability of the the folks that live up there to control what is going on behind those gates because you don't have access to it. Um, the other thing to, to remember here, or, or to understand, perhaps uh, the board ha is not aware, but R RMA and Redwood Ranch's attorneys have met and discussed how to cooperatively maximize the Georgia's big business plan. This is only the beginning of this plan. This, this, what, what they, according to the, the Georgia's own attorney during a meeting on November 5th, he stated, to achieve the full goal of the owner's business plan, you recommended that the project should go through an EIR. Redwood Ranch is willing to do so. He's writing this to Michael Washam. Yet the RMA has come in here today and said, we don't need to do an EIR. There's no substantial impacts. Well, wait a second here. They know that there are substantial impacts. They know that this is a big deal. This is a big venue. Why is it that they're, they're recommending that they do an EIR on one hand, and then on the other hand, they're sitting here telling you there's no reason to do an EIR? Well, is it because if you operate 12 events or 24 events, it suddenly changes? Well, perhaps if that's a matter of degree, then CEQA requires that you undertake an EIR. Well, the reason they're doing this is because Redwood Ranch has already fully booked their calendar for this, 
2019. And so in order to accommodate as many of those events as they can, they're seeking a special use permit. And at the same time, they're seeking the e they're, they've started the EIR process. So, and this isn't my speculation on this. This is their own correspondence, and if you'd like a copy of it, I can provide it to you. Their own attorney's correspondence. And they're, they're talking about this, uh, the steps that they're gonna take, and they're working cooperatively with RMA to achieve this objective. Now, it's a, he says, he continues that, we understand that we will be seeking the SUP that will allow a maximum of 12 events per year, but irrespective of the SUP process and what happens at the Planning Commission, that process will not provide the full entitlements that Redwood Ranch is seeking. Therefore, we want to commence the EIR for the full project plan now. This is in November. This isn't like it was years ago. This is the plan that's in effect that they're doing. Even if the SUP is granted for 12 events per year, the Redwood Ranch has its 13th event of 2020 booked for early August. So our, our admittedly ambitious goal is to complete the EIR and the grant of entitlements prior to that date. Interestingly enough, when you go through and you look at the events that Redwood Ranch has listed on their, their website, uh, they have uh, their 12 events listed. But we've, my clients have found other weddings that are not listed on here. Now, it would seem to me that a wedding would qualify as an event under what we're talking about here. Maybe I say that because I got married, it was about 12 years ago, and I can tell you that it was an event. Uh, and I'm still married, fortunately. Uh, but there's no, there's no question that uh, a wedding is an event. So I don't know how it is that these events have been determined or whether they're just based on the size of the event and they're excluding smaller events. I don't, again, uh, these are issues that that are unclear here, but the Board of Supervisors should make sure that they're very clear about what's going on up there and whether there's, there's a, trying to be a circumvention of, of the 12 events that are allowed here. Now, to me, it's very clear. If there's a wedding or there's a party, there's an event. Most vacation rentals and managers strictly prohibit parties and, and weddings at their vacation rentals. That's that's typical, I know, because I've drafted many of these agreements. I have these agreements and I've seen them. So it would, be, it would seem very clear that if they're going to have any event such as this, that it needs to be on their calendar and that they're not permitted to have small events under, under the radar. Uh, again, the issue here is compliance. How are the residents, the South Fork residents and other folks supposed to ensure that there's compliance with Redwood Ranch's numbers, whether it's the uh, 80 guests that are camping or whether it's 250 guests at a party, it's virtually impossible. And it's not like they can call Mr. Bach to come up at 11 o'clock at night to take a decibel reading. Uh, it's not gonna happen. If they call the sheriff, they know it's gonna be an hour or two or more, depending on what else is going on down in the valley before uh, somebody can come up there to see what's going on. Now. I am going to uh, reiterate, I'm, I'm not here as a firefighter, but I am going to discuss some of the fire issues. I discussed some of those last time when I was here uh, with regards to Sunshine Ranch, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna go over all that again. But I am gonna talk about some things here that are, that are much more significant than what we talked about with Sunshine. Uh, while there are plans in place that Mr. Bach talked about to evacuate the building and there are, uh, the, in the, the fire documents, there are statements by Mr. Meyer that talk about where not to park, how many water tanks and such to have. Conspicuously absent from any of this is an evacuation plan for 250 or more people should a emergency event such as a wildfire occur. Before you, approve this project, you have to ask yourselves, in the, event of a in the event of a fire, how are you going to evacuate these folks down or out of there? The reality is you can't. You cannot do it. Not within, not within hours, because most of these folks are gonna have been shuttled in. You can't just run shuttles up and down, up and down, up and down to get these people out. These are things that occur in a matter of minutes, not hours. You don't have hours to get folks out of 
out of these locations. Who flees? Who doesn't? Is it women and children first? Do the men have to stay uh, as something's coming up? And, and if the fire is coming up the canyon, if there's a fire started below the canyon, and as is typical in South Fork, the wind blows up the canyon every day in the summer. How are you going to get out? There's no way out. You cannot shelter in place in a gravel parking lot, 250 people plus staff. You also have the cumulative impact with Sunshine Ranch up even further of trying to get those folks out if there's a major wildfire event. This is something you have to think about. The, the Tulare County Board of Supervisors has to think about because if this comes and this reality ever were to happen, you can bet your you know what that the lawyers are gonna come swarming in here and say, how did you approve this knowing what, what you know, you couldn't get these people out? How could you approve this? In fact, the, uh, Mr. Meyer's own documents talks about 150 people, and, and here we have now 250. Mr. Bach talked about the fact that uh, this project was not expanded from the original application, but it was actually limited. However, if you look through the application that was submitted, I believe it was by Mr. Mr. Uh, Andrew George, um, and it was signed by him as well, and, and this is in uh, March of 2019, what he talks about is that uh, the total acreage or area being used is plus or minus one acre. We know that it's larger than that. According to this, it says 2.5 acres. <laughs> this is primarily weekends, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m., and we know that's been expanded to 11 p.m. Uh, we know that in here, they said this was only up to 100 people. On page 8 of 14 of the application that was made, the expected number of attendees was 20 to 100. They proposed entertainment was acoustic only. The only amplification type was the announcer's microphone. That's all changed. This is much greater. And the reason is because they were doing all these things anyway, it was well documented. So when they came in here with this permit they're seeking, now they're seeking all of this, this amplification and bands. You can, you can see the pictures in the, the documentation that I provided to RMA, where they had multiple, they had live bands with, with stages, they had 10 foot high by 10 foot wide speakers. They had, they had some of the, the stages had, had two drum sets on them, guitars lined up, lights. <clears throat> it's party time. <coughs> Interestingly enough, in March of 2019, Mr. George, Mr. Andrew George wrote to Tulare County RMA, and he said, amplification in events is restricted to one microphone for announcing only and must be turned off, to 10, off after 10 p.m. Yet, I have an entire brief filled with pictures and pictures and pictures of what was really going on. By the way, I live in Three Rivers and the hills are already turning brown and it's February. So this fire issue is, it, it's, it's serious. It really is a serious issue for uh, everyone to think about. And, and it's not that we're picking on the, the Georges. It's not that anybody has any problem with them personally. It's the nature of what they're trying to do in the location they're trying to do it. Um, you know, the special use permit process is here for a reason. It's here for the, the Board of Supervisors to look at these issues and decide whether or not it's appropriate. Even if RMA says that they think it's fine, ultimately you have to make the decision whether or not you want to risk these people's lives. Most of the visitors that come up there aren't going to have thought for a second that they're going to any place that's unsafe, that they could be trapped or entrapped. They don't know. Most of them are city folk. Not that there's anything wrong with that, of course. Uh, certainly, they're not going to they're not going to survive a fire in the tents that are that are set out in the parking lot. <clears throat> One of the the key components of the special use permit process for Tulare County is Section 16 V07 establishes certain minimum criteria and findings. There's no way that item number four, which requires that. Uh, the public and private roads providing access to the subject property meet necessary standards to provide safe and adequate access or have been amended by conditions of approval to satisfy the access requirements. You can't do that given what we know is a very high, the highest fire risk in the state. 
in that area. And no, way, no other way in or no other way out, but a road in which two vehicles in many, many places cannot even pass, let alone rescue or fire equipment. Would you please wrap up your comments? I've given you an extra five minutes. Yes, thank you, and I will. Uh, the road is a critical issue, and we have submitted uh, a report by an expert regarding the road, and the analysis uh, that was done by uh, RMA was based on a, an outdated standard that was highlighted in the report. <clears throat> it was a, a standard based on in 2002 and the, or 2008. The current standards are, are uh, different than that. The other reason that the road is a really critical factor in an analysis for you as to whether or not to approve this is that what you have at, uh, at Redwood Ranch is you have this big party scene, and you have people, a lot of vehicles driving, anywhere from 30, 30 to 50 cars can, can park there. With the amount of alcohol that's being served and the lack of control over that, many of these events, all the alcohol is just laid out for anyone to use to drink. <coughs> Uh, there's no uh, regulation. Some of the events have bartenders, some of them don't. Some of them you're allowed to bring your own alcohol and, ser and serve it. Uh, with those lack of controls, those people are going to be driving down that road. They're going back down to the hotels, the vacation rentals, the other places, because they're not all staying at Redwood Ranch. If you have 250 people there, some of them are being shuttled in, but many of them are going to be driving. And we know what's going to happen eventually when that ends when that happens. In fact, just last week we had a visitor in Three Rivers who'd been smoking marijuana, drinking alcohol, ran off the road, totaled his vehicle. Actually, it was his mother's vehicle. Uh, but the reality is, luckily, nobody, no in, no, nobody who was innocent was injured in that. He hurt himself, but he didn't hurt anybody else. But given, given that long, treacherous road, it's only a matter of time here. Uh, some of the additional concerns uh, that was raised by uh, Supervisor Townsend was regarding the lighting. Uh, I had occasion uh, not too long ago, although it, it was over a month ago, to drive down that road at night from Ladybug, where I was up with my son doing a hike. We came down in the evening, and we came around the corner, and lo and behold, it was, it was like string town full of lights. There were lights hanging off the buildings and lights. They're the cafe-style lights. So what they are is they're, they're just the, the little lights, and they light up. They're not directional. They don't direct down. They just light. They throw light 360 de you know, degrees, essentially. And there were strings of lights all over the place. I, I, I was floored. And I knew that Redwood Ranch was there, but I was floored by the amount of light crisscrossing all over and to and from the buildings and in the trees and such. It's not just, just, just me or other folks that, that have to deal with this. It's the wildlife. Uh, the impacts to the wildlife. Now, the National Park Service and Fish and Game were not advised of the actual scope of this project and were not provided an ample and sufficient opportunity to comment on this because they were never advised of what Redwood Ranch is seeking to do, not in the special use permit and not with regards to the upcoming EIR. So this project should be denied. We've, I talked previously in the Sunshine Ranch about the Foothill Growth Management Plan, and uh, a lot of the issues that are, uh, apply there apply here. I'm going to try and wrap this up quickly, so those, I'm not going to go over that again. But again, one of the important things to remember here is that the special use permit process, Tulare County's own process, has a number of of requirements that have to be met. One of them I went over was item number four, the public and private roads. Uh, the other is that the special use permit shall be granted only if it is found that the establishment, maintenance, and operation and use of the building or land applied for will not, under the circumstances of the particular case, be detrimental to the health, safety, peace, morals, comfort, and general welfare of persons residing or working in the neighborhood. Folks, this is totally out of character with what is, has been up South Fork since at least time began, and people have been inhabiting that area. This is not a venue that is appropriate for that location. It's not appropriate for the folks that live there. It's not appropriate for the, the health and safety, the road, the noise, the light. Uh, and there's been inadequate amount of study done regarding the wildlife. But certainly for the people, the people that live there, 
That's the requirement, that it can be detrimental to them, and it has been. And even if you put into place these restrictions, they're still going to have to put up with that. Maybe to a lesser degree than the completely unfettered that has gone on in the past, but nevertheless, it's it's a substantial diminishment of the enjoyment of their own private property and their own rights. So, with that, I'm going to ask you very strongly to uh, uh, not approve this project. And uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I certainly any here to answer, or I can submit any of these documents. Okay. Seeing no questions, I will now uh, look to the. Uh, applicant uh, or its representatives, uh, you may now uh, use this time for rebuttal. And you have fi 15 minutes as well. I hope that uh, you can keep it to the, that time frame as well. I'm going to try to make it five minutes. All right. That would be great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and supervisors and staff. My name is Eric George. And my only regret is that we cannot have this hearing on site. Because what you would see is 190 acres of really stunning beauty, only a sliver of which is used for what you've been hearing about. You can't use the remainder of it unless you want a hideously bad case of poison oak. It's a lot of brush. But the part that you can use is extraordinary. It's a river. It's a driveway that comes down to a barn. There is an area where people can enjoy really meaningful hiking and other experiences in nature. And it's really something else. It wasn't that way when my brother Andrew and I, who's sitting right here, bought the ranch in 2014. It was strange. There was loads of litter everywhere, fences that led nowhere, pipes in the river, a mucky koi pond that had been recently installed, chains on trees, and things like that. We've really made it something else. And I'm really proud of it. And I should point out, I've been in Three Rivers. My family's been a property owner in Three Rivers since the early 1970s. So I'm not going to give anybody bragging rights over knowing Three Rivers better. I, I love Three Rivers. And I love this place that we've created. Um, it's a terrific place for our family and for friends. Uh, I'm proud of how we've improved the land. And yes, one joy, a fairly unexpected joy, has been sharing this. And what we did is we took advantage of the fact that the prior owners had rented out the property from time to time. And what they had done is they had occasionally had weddings and other events. And we continued that sporadically. My mindset at first was, why not? This will be a good way to make some money to be able to pay for an on-site caretaker. Uh, who we have is a very responsible man. Uh, but something really incredible happened. I think we've now had visitors from 23 countries. We've had all sorts of reviews. And not to get too corny about it, but you really get a sense that there is a hunger that a lot of people have to be able to go into an area that has real wildlife and beauty and experience it. And that's been an incredibly satisfying thing to see. I, I want to be so clear on this point, though, because as I sit here and I'm listening to some of the things that counsel said, and I know he's an advocate, they're just not remotely part of reality. There's some stark misrepresentations, and it's really not a representation of what you'd experience if you were there. I, I want to make clear that we do not engage in any commerce of any sort. Uh, there's no exploitation of any of the resources. There's no providing of services. What we do is we allow certain individuals on responsible and limited terms and conditions to host certain events, whether it's a wedding or a Boy Scout troop or a family reunion. And again, as uh, the supervisors know, it's just 12 of these a year. So I want to pivot and talk about how I really have embraced the process of working with the RMA. I can't say this sincerely enough. We're a better place because of it. Uh, they've done an unbelievable job in terms of their dedication of time and their professionalism. Uh, that we now know that with respect to claims, whether they were made in good faith or not, about light pollution or noise pollution, uh, fire safety, use of the road, we've got a really good and responsible thing. And, 
And let me just point out briefly, I, I didn't want to spend much time responding to counsel, but when I hear things like the fear of, of deaths through fire and, quote, people aren't going to survive a fire there, let me remind everybody, we're three and a half miles away from the very ladybug campsite that was mentioned, a national park site with many areas that are offered for campers. Any criticism that might be made of the possibility of fire or danger that is downriver applies with even greater force upriver. If this is really a problem we're hearing about, I would expect there to be major complaints made to the National Park Service. Uh, things about destruction of peace and quiet, just utter nonsense. And I, I want to point out, too, that there is one misrepresentation that was made that I actually wish were accurate, that this is a, quote, profitable endeavor. Really? Well, I wish that were so. It is not so. And let me add that every penny that has come in in revenue, let's not confuse revenue and profit, has gone right back into betterment of the property. Uh, I, I want to conclude, because I do want to stick to my own time limit, and just point out that everything that has been recommended by the RMA and that was approved by the Planning Commission, we embrace. Uh, whether that's working with fire officials, uh, working with and accepting any conditions pertaining to plant or animal life. We regard ourselves as good stewards of that. And same for any Native uh, American sites. This is something that has got to be a benefit to everybody in Three Rivers and to those people who choose to visit it. I think it is very much in keeping with and actually reflects beautifully upon Three Rivers. I'm very proud of it, and if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Any questions from any of my colleagues? Okay, thank you very thank you, much Mr. for Chairman. your uh, presentation. Uh, now I will uh, open it up for uh, public comment. Uh, any uh, person may comment on this item. Public comment can will be limited to three minutes. Uh, is there anybody wishing to uh, make a comment at this time? Please come forward, state your name and address. But pull that microphone around to you, Alan. Thank you. I live at 19501 Avenue 364 in Woodlake, just up near Elderwood. Um, my wife, <coughs> Kathy, and I uh, have a catering business called All Fired Up Pizza, and we've been doing it for about 10. We're starting our 10th year right now. We're retired teachers. Pete was, uh, my wife was teaching at the school where Pete was yeah. in high school. She taught me math. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, um, this year, uh, we're beginning our 10th year, and we travel to Tulare, Kings, and, and Fresno County, and we do catering. We take our oven on a trailer, we go to your house, we, we assemble our pizzas and bake them in our wood-fired oven and serve them to your, to your client, your guests. Uh, we, we do, we've done jo uh, business jobs for up from like 20 people to 150 people we're, we're making in pizzas. Uh, when it comes to Redwood Ranch and Three Rivers, uh, we were hired last year for nine events. Um, uh, they're a good customer of ours, so I have, we have kind of a vested interest. The average number of guests that we served last year was 71, 71 guests. Uh, the smallest was 30th, and the largest was 120. Uh, some of our events are for the, the uh, wedding rehearsal dinner, so it's a smaller group. Uh, others are for the actual event, so it's a larger group. Uh, we arri usually arrive around in the in late afternoon, and we, um, we set up and we make pizzas for a couple hours, and then we clean up and we're gone. We're there usually for about three hours. So from the time we get there to the time we leave, it's about three hours. It's in the dark when we usually leave. Um, I can only speak about what I've seen driving up there, being there, and then driving home. So that's my experience. Um, all the clients that we've dealt with have been very nice. And as you mentioned before, uh, they're not from this area. They're from the city. They're city folk, and usually from the Bay Area or Southern California. Uh, uh, when we speak to their guests, they're not just from those areas. They're from further away. They've flown into the area and come there. So they're experiencing our area for the first time, most of them. Um, 
The facility is well taken care of. Uh, we have we work on the graveled area for what, where we set up and, and serve our, our guests. Uh, there's water, there's electricity, there are amazing uh, portable uh, uh, bathrooms. Um, the people that are there, they're, we're only there for three hours. They're, some, they're there for two or three days sometimes. So they're not just staying on site. They're going to the park. They're going to the lake. They're going on the river. They're doing amazing things. So they're enjoying amazing things. Um, the road concerns, uh, it's, it's six, seven and a half miles up to the site from Highway 198. Six miles of it are a nice paved two-lane road. The last mile and a half is, is a winding, kind of rough road. Uh, and in our experience there, we've been up and down, up nine times, down nine times. I think I can only see, remember three times where we even counted another vehicle that we had to pull over, they had to pull over to pass on that road. But we've always done it. It hasn't been an issue. Um, um, we're, we, were, we like that we see that using use of the chartered vans to keep traffic down on the road. Um, <clears throat> our, our employees, usually it's my wife and I, and we have two, usually two workers. And uh, our workers will ride together in a car rather than having two cars come up down that road. Uh, because it is a little bit strange, the last uh, mile and a half. Uh, sound levels, again, speaking from my experience, the sound level of the wedding activities has never been very high. We have done a number of events at other locations where there are bands and loud DJs, but all the events that we have uh, had there had acoustical, interest of, uh, acoustical instruments and some sort of sound source, usually a phone or, a, or an iPod or something that's playing the music through uh, speakers. Would you wrap up your comments, Alan? Okay. Um, past time work. There are a lot of events occurring at Bedwood Ranch that we're not hired to be at, and even those that we are present for, we are there around three hours, so the actual event uh, might last two or three days. I have only spoken about the nine events that we have attended, and each one is well planned and attended by a lot of well-behaved people who are experiencing a very nice event. It was located at one of the most beautiful areas in Tulare County. I encourage you to work with the residents of the area and the owners of Redwood Ranch and develop a plan that will allow the venue to continue to provide a special place for creating those special memories while at the same time providing for the safety and security of the surrounding residents. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your comments. I have a public comment request form from uh, Adina Alati. Hi, my name's Adina Alati. I live at 2609 South Mendonca here in Visalia, and I'm actually representing Elaine DeCasian, who is with Trabian Fine Catering. Um, I also am an event manager myself, and I do several venues. Um, Elaine couldn't be here this morning because she had to work, <laughs> but she wrote a statement. I love the ranch, and so do the incredible people who come from all over the world to be in this place to exchange their vows, build memories, and not only to take place in the beauty and atmosphere, but to be in nature. These people do not come here to party, consume ridiculous amounts of alcohol, or to raise hell. They come here for just the opposite. They sip lovely wines, eat great food, dance a little, and sit by the river or the fire pit and take peace in the experience. These aren't huge loud events where the bride and groom don't know half of the people in their own wedding. These are intimate gatherings of people who have their closest friends and family in attendance. I have done countless weddings there, and I have never experienced anything negative. Everyone abides by the rules and have always been nothing but kind and respectful. I have met some of the most interesting people in my long career here. They are people who carefully choose where they want to be married or celebrate their family events. They are professionals, world travelers, multilingual, lovers of nature, and intelligent. When it's time to shut down, they shut down. Cleanup is handled, garbage is packed up, the music stops, the bar closes. To not have this place would be such a shame. I can't tell you how happy coming here makes people. Redwood River Ranch is my favorite place to work, and I have worked all over the state. I implore you to let it continue to bring joy to those that wish to visit this ranch. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any additional public comments? 
Please come forward, state your name and address. Hi, my name is Justine Fisher and I'm here with Sierra Sanitation. Um, we've been working with Red Ridge Branch for several years now for their portable toilet usage and so they don't impact their septic system. And I can tell you in all the years we've worked, worked with them that they've always been responsible to have the additional VIP units on site for their guests. There's never been an issue that they needed us to come up and do additional services over the weekend. It's been taken care of to take care of all of their guests. And I can tell you over the several years that we've been up there, there's been a lot of improvements on the ranch. I think it's a beautiful place. I hear a lot of good comments and um, responses from people that call my business to run our VIP units. And I think it's a beautiful place to let them have their venue. Great, thank you. Additional public comment? Hello, my name is Haley Thorne, uh, address 43168 North Kauai River Drive. I, uh, I'm a Three Rivers resident, clearly, born and raised. My family has uh, resided there since the late 1800s. <laughs> I know what a special, unique place Three Rivers is. I also know that even the smallest change can be challenging for Three Rivers residents. Uh, I personally support good people doing good things. I've had the pleasure to get to know Eric and Andrew on a personal level. Um, they are the kindest, most generous people. I've spent a lot of time at the ranch. I've attended a couple weddings there. Definitely the mellowest weddings I have ever attended. <laughs> like everyone was saying, people get married there for the serene nature I've been to wide array of weddings in my life and um, there, there's a reason why people choose this venue. It's, it's not for a party environment. Um, they, I know that this family has supported our Three Rivers community for a long time. They've supported our school. They're continuing to do so and I am thrilled to have them in Three Rivers, a place where I move back to raise my small children. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Additional public comments? Please come forward, state your name and address. Good afternoon. Uh, hi, my name is Mike Canarosi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here. I'm 25 year general contractor in Three Rivers and just want to assure you uh, when you get to know if you get an opportunity to know the integrity of the George brothers the way I have, what started as a business relationship has turned into what's going to be a long-term friendship. And through the course of this, I've, I've seen them change in, in response to neighbors and put forth a, a proposal. And with absolute certainty, uh, I do believe that uh, all the guidelines that have been put forth by the Planning Commission will be followed to a T in the operation of Redwood Ranch. That's really about all I had to say. Great, thank you. Additional public comment? Good morning, my name is Esther Hacker. I live at 46726 South Fork Drive. I'm an immediate neighbor to the Redwood Ranch. Uh, previously, I have either sent in comments um, to the county. I have spoken at the Planning Commission. Uh, and in fact, our family even invited Eric and um, Andrew to our house last April to discuss our concerns about the ranch with noise, traffic, fire. I would like to use my time at this time, though, to clarify a few things about the special use permit. Um, one of them is the time for desisting at the uh, Planning Commission, my understanding, and the motion I heard from John Elliott was that it would desist that all amplified music and all would desist at 10 p.m., not 11 p.m. Um, so I would like some clarification on that. I know that uh, events are supposed to be posted for neighbors and the RMA. 
10 days prior? How, how are these being posted? Is it just their website? Or I would like to know that. Another is how many days is it on an event? The special use permit, the temporary one that they received at the end of the year, uh, stated Friday through Sunday was considered an event over those days. However, two of the four temporary events were more than that. One was four days, one was five days. When you get into events that are five days, that's quite a bit of difference than just over a weekend. So I'd like to know um, what the special use permit says regarding um, the length of days and the days of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Any additional public comments this morning? Okay, seeing no additional public comments, I will bring it back to the board. Um, Mr. Bach, do you have a, uh, a response? Uh, yes, uh, Chairman Vanderpool, I just wanted to respond in the record in regards to uh, um, <clears throat> the actual uh, engineering uh, report that was done and uh, say that um, even though the engineer stated that we used a uh, older version of the ITE, uh, that in fact he didn't state how it changed any of the uh, studies that we did or any numbers whatsoever. It just stated we were using an older version. So I don't know how you want to take that information. But uh, again, uh, merely stating that you used an older version isn't a fact into its self warranting fair argument. Um, <clears throat> and as far as the clarifications, yes, Mr. Elliott did say amplified sounds would cut off at 10, and uh, we did cut off the events. Uh, I stand corrected, Mr. Townsend. As far as the events would stop 10 o'clock on Sunday. So, um, if there is any other questions the board may have for me. Any additional questions for staff? Okay, seeing none, we will now close the uh, public testimony and bring it to the board for uh, action and direction. Supervisor uh, Crocker, I'll turn to you. Uh, actually, I have Supervisor Valero. He snuck in there with an electronic ping, so I'll let him go first. Uh, go ahead, Supervisor Valero. Okay, um, so I'll just start. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here for this particular item, and especially for those individuals that provided context for the item. After reviewing the Redwood Ranch item before us, I was a little hesitant about the use of such space. Um, and when reviewing the illustrations in the packet, starting on page 197, I was even more concerned about the use of such space for these kind of activities. But again, these pictures are coming from one side of both parties. So just wanted to make that clear. Uh, because when I did look at one in particular, it was on page 207 and there was some type of paddling going on in the, uh, that venue space, uh, in addition to some items uh, that centered on marijuana and drinking, uh, which may further impair users of such space, especially if and when guests are traveling home. To me, judgment is loose in this case, uh, but to me, it concerns me that when people leave this place, the responsibility becomes everyone else's and our roads become less safe. Still, I understand that this can and does happen anywhere and everywhere. And I understand that this meets our county policy. I, retu I return to our TP example, the example with the Sunshine uh, Project that was mentioned earlier, um, and feel that each item should be judged accordingly. Was I personally in favor of it? More no than yes. But I'd like to hold each case to the standard of our county policy. And I am aware that at least 70 conditions have already been included in this project. And these concessions are necessary for the protection of neighbors, neighborhoods, and longstanding ambiance already in place. And so, again, I'd just like to thank and reiterate these individuals that came forward today um, and, and share their uh, experiences with this venue as well. Thank you, Supervisor. Supervisor Crocker. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, I did have, uh, if if I could, ask uh, staff um, some questions as far as to clarify the last uh, testimony. Um, I know you discussed the time of shutdown, but can you um, discuss um, the how we determine events 
as and the length of those events as well as how we notify uh, individuals what that process looks like? Uh, so what we've said in our conditions is that we would notify everybody 10 days in advance of any event. We consider the whole weekend an event. Um, so uh, we don't uh, separate out the days necessarily by event. Um, and so the shutdown times are 11, uh, but the, uh, as per Mr. Elliott, we would actually stop the amplified noise, uh, again, consistent with the Lions Club at, at 10 o'clock. So. Um, and uh, we have, uh, in addition, offered to actually do uh, some inspections uh, at night of these events. I even offered myself to go out there. Uh, so yes, I, I, I will, thought you uh, would go out at the I, 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 night. I will, I will take my uh, noise meter with me uh, as part of the challenge uh, was offered earlier. So the notification of events. So how was that? Uh, was some that online. We, we will do it. They'll post it online. We'll also receive the schedule of events for the year. So if they're outside of those events, we'll know right away. Uh, if we're, we don't catch it, I'm sure the neighbors will. And so the, um, um, we also will be able to, um, when they do post 10 days in advance, we'll be able to uh, notice that as well. And can you discuss um, how enforcement of the 70 conditions, what that looks like? Well, it, um, we're, we are uh, not going to ad ad advertise that we're coming out. Uh, the first time I did offer to do that, but after that, we will uh, actually inspect the site um, prior to, again, similar to Lions Club, we will inspect the site to make sure they're meeting their conditions. Um, uh, as far as lighting and other things, we can see right away whether the event's happening or not. And then when we're at the events, we'll be able to uh, note any uh, violations of the conditions and then uh, look for uh, a process to, to fix those conditions. So we're planning on being proactive if this is approved as yeah, far as a typical reactive yeah, or we, neighbor's complaint. We are being very proactive given the sports concerns with this party barn in particular, but uh, other ones as well. So this is going to become part of our policies and procedures uh, at RMA. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with all my questions, I've got comments, but if sure, it, go ahead. You can go ahead and make your comments. That's fine. That's um, one, I, I appreciate um, the time and effort, and I know there's been uh, numerous uh, letters and emails and phone calls that have come into the Board of Supervisors' office regarding this project in particular for months. Um, I know this has been um, this has been something that has been a lengthy process to get to this point, um, but I do think that uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned um, some of the things that I, I think are very unique, the 70 conditions of approval, um, the maximum of 12 events per year, uh, the shuttle requirements for large events, limiting the noise and limiting the time, I think are all things that um, make this unique to many other um, party barn event type venues that the rest of the county has. Um, I know that um, we've talked about in the past, Supervisor Townsend's brought up uh, at our board meeting that we held in Ivanhoe about bringing back an, a noise ordinance because that is something of an issue um, countywide. And so, you know, trying to work on that and making sure that we are doing something along those lines to try and uh, make sure that we're not only protecting the personal property of the individual owners, but protecting the, the property of our neighbors as well and making sure that they have uh, a certain right to their property um, that they have and, and nuisances is um, infringing upon their rights when there are nuisances. So um, I think though that there's also something that hasn't been um, discussed and that's um, personal responsibility. It's something that um, you know wasn't shared today but there's, there has to be some level of personal responsibility on behalf of um, individuals that are interested in using this site um, that they recognize some of the um, potential uh, hazards or issues that might be by ha being in a remote location. And um, I think that goes to the point for um, anyone that's going into Mineral King or other parts of the National Park um, that are very remote. Um, I recognize that there are issues and challenges, um, but that um, ultimately we've, we've got to take some ownership for our, our decisions that we make. That's all the 
comments I have. Okay, Supervisor Shuckley. Uh, I just want to echo that. I was going to also mention just with the conditions that have, have been set and uh, the property rights uh, of the folks at the Redwood Ranch and their neighbors. And I also want to uh, highlight also the business that it provides for some of the uh, provides business opportunities for, as we heard, a lot of our local businesses and caterers and all that, which I think is uh, a very important aspect of this. Okay. Um, I uh, just want to make a few comments myself. I actually appreciated the uh, uh, comments of the property owner, and I appreciate the comments of uh, various small businesses and stakeholders in and around uh, uh, this project. Uh, I think that is helpful to hear from uh, those folks who are impacted. Um, and it's very helpful to hear from a property owner that actually is vested in the community and uh, gives back to the community and is well respected, uh, I think, for uh, uh, your generosity. And I think that says a lot about you. And it also says a lot about the project when you're willing to accept 70 conditions of approval. Um, that is definitely no uh, small feat. Um, and you are going to be incredibly constrained if this project is approved. Um, but again, taking that personal and individual responsibility is an important thing. Uh, you know, code of conduct of your guests, you know, you may be able to control uh, what they're doing, but hopefully we're all adults and uh, uh, they take that code of conduct or personal responsibility seriously as well because there are uh, neighbors around you who are affected as well and uh, other Tulare County residents. So uh, I do appreciate those comments. Um, is there any uh, need? Uh, from this board uh, for closed session? This is set for a closed session, or do you feel that we are uh, prepared to move forward at this time? Okay, uh, Chair will entertain a motion. SP 19-019. Okay, we have a motion from Supervisor Valero, a second by Supervisor Shuckleyan. Please vote. And, uh, and there, Go ahead. Oh, oh no, not to. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let me go back. So it would be to deny the appeal, yes, okay. and to affirm the planning commission's approval. Okay. Motion and second, both are staying the same. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much for uh, being here today and for uh, that presentation. You happen uh, to have any of those pizzas with you, by chance, sir? <laughs> Ready made. <laughs> um, it, it, board, we will take a, uh, a five minute recess uh, so that some of our older uh, em employees and uh, board members can use the restroom. <laughs> Back in session, uh, we will take up item seven at this time. This is a public hearing, which is now open, and this is uh, regarding the Lemon Cove community plan update. And that was a nice short sentence. And I will turn it over to you to read a very long presentation. Mr. Bach. Amy, she'll be back. Turn on your microphone there, Eric. Um, general, this is general plan amendment number GPA 17-007. This is the Lemon Cove community plan. Uh, our second to last community plan that we'll be working on uh, on the valley floor. <clears throat> so uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview before Dave, Dave steps up and gives you the rest of the presentation. We had uh, handouts for the board um, based on some comments that were delivered to the Planning Commission and uh, based on the, um, some of the responses from uh, the ag agencies. We just wanted to perfect the record. Uh, with these comments. This includes a, a petition to deny uh, one of the rezone considerations we have. So we wanted to bring that up first and foremost because this is uh, unique. We've never had a request like that before. Um, so this is the uh, general plan amendment, the Lemon Cove Community Plan 2019 GPA 17-007. Uh, this includes an initial study mitigating negative declaration. Uh, so this will help other projects move forward in the future we, so we can tear off this environmental uh, document. Uh, this is an amendment of section 18.9, uh, which does allow for mixed use overlays and uh, amendment of section 16, which allows by right uses and amendment to the zoning districts. Um, I did want to congratulate uh, Dave 
and Susan here for such a great effort working with the Lemon Cove Sanitation Department. Uh, I know there's been a history there, but I think we've worked through a lot of that. And again, I even want to congratulate the Sanitation District because they have been really helpful in hosting all of our meetings. Uh, we are um, just by way of background as well, uh, and for one supervisor here, we will start Springville uh, in the very near future, and, and that, that'll be our, our last one uh, before we move into the, the mountains or do something else. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave, and uh, he can take over. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman uh, Vanderpoel, members of the board, uh, Dr. Britt, uh, CAO, and, and Ms. Uh, Peterson, County Council. <laughs> Presented uh, for your consideration this morning is the uh, Lemon Cove Community Plan uh, GPA 17007. Initial study mitigated negative declaration, mitigation monitoring and reporting program, amendment of section 18.9, PZC 19-016, amendment of section 16 by right uses, PZC 19-017, and an amendment uh, to the zoning districts uh, within the proposed urban development boundary uh, as part of the rezoning plan, PZC 17-007. As part of the community outreach uh, process for the Lemon Cove Community Plan, uh, there were a host of meetings uh, with the Lemon Cove Sanitary District, and as Aaron mentioned, uh, we appreciate their cooperation uh, in accommodating us uh, at every one of their uh, meetings between August uh, and December of uh, 2019, uh, and also a uh, thank you uh, and an acknowledgement uh, for the uh, Sequoia Union uh, District uh, to accommodate uh, several public outreach meetings uh, there and uh, passing out flyers uh, to the students uh, to encourage uh, their families to uh, participate in the process. Uh, Lemon Cove is located on Highway 198 uh, east of Visalia uh, and uh, southwest of Three Rivers. Uh, in regards to the mitigated negative declaration and mitigation and monitoring program, uh, it was determined uh, and as recommended uh, that a determination that there were less than significant impacts with mitigation uh, in regards to biological resources, cultural resources, tribal cultural resources, and man mandatory findings of significant uh, to require pre-construction surveys uh, in order to uh, reduce potential impacts to less than significant. Uh, there were technical memorandums for air quality, energy and greenhouse gas, uh, and a response to comments uh, that were included as part of the CEQA analysis. The existing uh, Lemon Cove uh, uh, urban development boundary is delineated in blue. Uh, with the Lemon Cove Sanitary District, uh, district boundaries uh, delineated in red. Uh, the current uh, UDB, uh, as previously adopted, uh, would represent uh, generally the sphere of influence uh, for the Lemon Cove Sanitary District. Uh, the adopted land use, um, consistent with the 2012 uh, general plan update, uh, is currently mixed use. Uh, it's recommended as part of the general plan amendment uh, that the existing urban development boundary of 400 acres be increased by approximately 270 acres for a total size of 673 acres. The UDB is essentially squared off to match uh, existing zoning districts um, as well as parcel lines uh, and or roadways. Uh, the current population um, as of the uh, 2017 census uh, information uh, is 232 residents. The median household income is approximately $52,000. Uh, 
there are 115 housing units. 84% uh, of those are single family units. 83% of those uh, housing uh, units are owner occupied. Uh, and again, the water and sewer uh, is provided by the Lemon Cove Sanitary District. The existing and proposed zoning districts are, are shown here side by side. Uh, to the left uh, represents the existing zoning. Uh, to the right uh, is the proposed zoning districts uh, consistent uh, with the uh, land use plan um, and the proposed community plans. The next slide uh, highlights the uh, proposed uh, zoning district changes. Uh, to make uh, a few highlights in regards uh, to the proposed zoning. Uh, existing commercial areas that are located along Highway 198 are recommended for uh, mixed-use zoning uh, consistent with our Section uh, 18.9 um, of the zoning ordinance to provide for flexibility uh, and a mixture of uses uh, to help to facilitate uh, economic development uh, within the community as well as to uh, provide a jobs housing balance uh, and to re uh, reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled. Uh, a couple of other uh, notable uh, recommendations uh, include uh, rezoning the Sequoia Union School uh, to professional offices uh, which would potentially accommodate uh, future partnerships uh, with uh, groups such as uh, Family Health Healthcare Network uh, to provide an on-campus uh, health facility uh, which the uh, uh, county has participated in uh, in other communities such as uh, Terabella and Traver. Uh, lastly, uh, promoting uh, residential development um, in and around the Sequoia Union School. Um, a host of parcels there are recommended for uh, rural residential zoning uh, which could accommodate uh, new residential development in close proximity uh, to the elementary school. And then recognizing uh, to the south, uh, the existing Lemon Cove RV Park, uh, changing uh, that uh, zoning uh, to be consistent with the existing use uh, for commercial recreation. Um, as per the materials that Aaron handed out, uh, there were some concerns that were raised uh, on the part of uh, some of the residents within the community uh, regards to uh, mixed-use zoning uh, proposed uh, within the uh, core area, the central business district and primary residential uh, area within the community of Three Rivers. Uh, there were two parcels, uh, APN 113-110-035 uh, and APN 113-210-032. Uh, that are located in the community uh, and delineated um, on the aerial. Uh, staff uh, had recommended uh, mixed-use zoning, uh, uh, R3 mixed-use. Uh, again, there were concerns that were uh, presented on the part of the community. Uh, and as a result of those concerns, uh, the Planning Commission uh, did not recommend those parcels uh, for the mixed-use overlay to be applied to them and they would be uh, retained uh, with their existing zoning of R3 uh, and RA um, as per their existing zoning districts uh, and as recommended uh, to your board uh, by the Planning Commission. Uh, in regards to uh, transportation and circulation, uh, Highway 198 is uh, recommended as a major arterial. Uh, Avenue 324 uh, would be uh, recognized as a minor arterial uh, and as well as uh, State Highway 216. A complete streets plan is recommended uh, for the uh, Lemon Cove Community Plan update, uh, consistent and uh, similar to other community plans uh, that have been proposed and adopted by your board. Uh, it's recommended uh, for complete streets to provide uh, connectivity, uh, fr again, from the uh, core community area uh, over to the Sequoia Union School. Uh, phase, phase one uh, would connect Highway 198 along Avenue 324 
uh, to the school, and then a phase two uh, recommended uh, complete streets project uh, between Avenue uh, 324 up to Avenue 330, uh, again running through the uh, central business district and uh, primary uh, residential area within the community. The mixed use uh, overlay zoning uh, as part of uh, zoning ordinance section 18.9 again is recommended to be included in into the community plan uh, which again uh, provides for flexibility for property owners uh, to promote uh, economic development, decrease vehicle miles traveled, uh, and to provide uh, jobs housing balance uh, within the community. Uh, by right zoning, uh, section 16 uh, is also recommended again to provide uh, increased uh, by right uses within the community uh, to provide uh, flexibility, uh, but that these uses do not have uh, an adverse uh, land use effect on property owners uh, based on uh, development standards uh, and other regulations that are included uh, within the uh, uh, zoning ordinance. The request uh, before your board this morning, again, is to hold a public hearing at 9.30 a.m. or shortly thereafter, approve the, uh, approve, the, approve the findings and recommendations of the Planning Commission as set forth in attached Exhibit A, adopt the initial study, mitigated negative declaration, and mitigation monitoring and reporting program, uh, State Clearinghouse 19-119031, uh, prepared for the 2019 Lemon Cove Community Plan, consistent with Planning Commission recommendation uh, as included in resolution number 9692, adopt general plan amendment GPA 17-007 for amendments to part three of the Tulare County general plan to establish a community plan for Lemon Cove and to part one of the general plan uh, in regards to amendments for the planning framework, land use, environmental resources management, open space, transportation and circulation elements consistent with planning commission recommendation resolution number 9693 uh, to amend section 18.9 PZC 19016 of the Tulare County Zoning Ordinance Number 352, establishing the mixed use combining zone uh, within Lemon Cove, consistent with Planning Commission Recommendation Resolution 9694. Uh, and just as a, uh, a side note uh, in regards to the recommendations for uh, Section 18.9. Um, at the request of the sanitary district uh, and some residents, uh, the M1 combining zone uh, is removed uh, as recommended um, as part of the planning commission and staff recommendation. Uh, so the uh, mixed use combining overlay zone uh, would just be applied uh, to uh, residential and commercial zoning and would not include uh, an M1 uh, designation uh, as part of uh, the recommendations to your board. Amend section 16 of ordinance number 352, the zoning ordinance to allow additional by right uses within the Lemon Cove community plan, uh, PZC 19-017, consistent with planning commission recommendation resolution number 9695. Uh, and finally, amend ordinance 352, the zoning ordinance as set forth in the zoning District Ordinance Maps for Lemon Cove PZC 17-007 consistent with the 2019 Lemon Cove Community Plan uh, to rezone certain properties consistent with Planning Commission Recommendation Resolution Number 9696. Uh, that concludes uh, staff uh, presentation this morning. Uh, we would be happy to um, entertain any questions that you may have. Any questions for uh, Mr. Bryan at this time? Okay, seeing none, uh, thank you, Dave, and we will open it up for any public comment. Is there anyone here wishing to comment on this uh, community plan update? Public comment can only be limited to three minutes.
Okay, seeing no uh, public comment, I will bring it back to uh, the board for uh, direction. Supervisor Crocker. <clears throat> I have a question for staff, so just for clarification, we um, <coughs> did incorporate the community's requests um, as far as to remove uh, properties from mixed use. Uh, I, I know that stated we were removing two APNs. Were there any others that were asked for? Uh, no, all of the other uh, 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 recommendations uh, were approved by the Planning Commission in regards to uh, staff's proposed rezoning plan. Uh, those were the only two parcels uh, that were uh, recommended to not be included as part of the uh, rezoning process uh, by the uh, Planning Commission. Um, all of the others, uh, um, as proposed, uh, are recommended as part of the uh, staff recommendation and Planning Commission recommendations. So the community members that are present in the audience, this is, this is A-OK. -okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Half the community is here today, Supervisor <laughs> Crocker. It's good to get those. Uh, and they chose up. a great meeting to yeah. come. Okay. Any additional uh, questions or comments from board members? All right. Chair will entertain direction. Move to approve. I have a motion by Supervisor Crocker. Second by Supervisor Townsend. Please vote. Motion approved five to zero. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, only one more community plan to go. Take your time with that last one, though, at Springville. <laughs> uh, 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 by the way, we're also doing Kingsburg, Delano, and Cutler Rossi. So, okay. This, uh, don't that's even worry. We're don't, starting on. Don't even worry about Cutler Rossi. That's fine. Uh, oh, sorry, Eddie. My bad. Um, okay, now we are uh, going to be moving on to the most exciting item of today's agenda. Uh, yeah, a round of applause for anybody that could anybody stay awake wait? until this point, uh, Roland. Uh, we now have item 22, which is a presentation given by the Assessor Clerk Recorder's Office regarding an overview of his department. And that, you know, actually quite interesting. Uh, I've been on the board in my 12th year, and I've never seen a single person practice a PowerPoint presentation before a board meeting. And I saw you practicing here in the chambers last week, Roland, and that was, it was hilarious. Week. <laughs> okay, your, your presentation, Roland. All right. Well, practice makes perfect, bud. Good morning, I, and I'm very happy to still say good morning. I was afraid that I would have to say good afternoon. Uh, I commend you all. I don't know how you do it. I've just lost my morning nap. I don't know if I've been awake this long in quite some time. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to uh, provide you an update overview. I think it states a high-level overview. Now, I don't know whether that means uh, the persons are high-level or the view is high-level. So anyway, uh, Roland Hill, Tulare County Assessor Clerk Recorder here this morning with Assistant Assessor Clerk Recorder Tim Kokendorfer. Tim's going to handle all the, uh, the, the technical hard questions, I guarantee you. Uh, so, brief introduction, just we're going to talk, have a little overview, we're going to talk about structure, the demographics of the office, the department, assessment role, workload, Williamson Act, clerk recorder issues, and then some challenges and strategies. I guarantee you we're not going to take up a lot of your time. Why do you have an assessor's office? Well, unfortunately, it's constitutionally established. You can't get rid of me. Uh, in 1852, it was one of the first nine offices elected in, in the county, and it's a very interesting historical And you have bit. to be one of the original I wasn't there elected at the, I, assessors. I wasn't there at the correct? election. I knew you were going to say something, so I was ready for you. <laughs> 109 votes were cast. I was not one of the 109. Uh, if you ever get really bored, it's a very interesting little historical uh, vignette. Uh, for you UCLA grads, that's a short kind of sketch. Uh, about the first election, the first assessor did not even live through his first year of term because he got shot in a gambling uh, debt shootout. Uh, it, was, it was a rough and tumble place, and it hasn't changed a lot, has it? Uh, so you have an assessor. It's a constitutionally... Uh, uh, elected and established. Uh, 
Our job is to discover, identify, value all assessable properties. We have approximately 175,000 assessments, and the, this is one of the big reasons why you want us. Roughly $365 million in annual revenue comes to the county by way of the assessed role. And that we work on a $10.3 million annual budget at this time, so hey, we pay off. We're a good deal. So our structure, we have two different, basically two different divisions, the assessor division, clerk recorder division of the department. In the assessor side, we have the appraisal, values all the, the assessable properties, the assessment support division, handles the legal document analyses, the public contacts, all the exemptions and exclusions. And then the cadastral division creates all the maps for the assessment purposes. Uh, on the clerk recorder side, the clerk's office handles the vital records, births, deaths, marriages, fictitious business names, oaths of office, notaries, and then the recorder's office records and preserves all the public documents, uh, deeds, and judgments. So serving a very um, key, useful purpose uh, for, the, uh, for the county of Tulare, obviously, on that clerk recorder side. There are a lot of people that just soon not see the assessor, not have an assessor, not, you know, but from your standpoint, from uh, Dr. Britt, is this something new? Is this, uh... but certainly from Jason's point of view, you need the money, it's general fund though. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the assessor demographics, we currently have right at 89 employees. Uh, the average age, this is, this is a segue for you. Yeah, I, I was just looking for a category of 80 plus or just <laughs> ancient. Average uh, age, 42 the... right now with eight years average service. Uh, just, just a bit of, you know, uh, Trivia, not necessarily trivia, because it fits into the strategic part of it. Uh, you know, we've, we, we suffer a, a, a retention factor. We have a roughly a 57 or 50 percent retention rate for new staff that have been hired over the last nine years. And so, say 18 years ago, the average, uh, that eight years of service, the average was 22. Now we're down to eight. We're seeing this cycle of more mature, uh, knowledgeable people leaving and, and getting new people in, and it, it presents those challenges that all, all of your departments are having with hiring, retention, uh, the training. Down to where the rubber meets the road for the assessor's division, the 2019 Assessment role was at 36.5 billion. It was a 5.12% increase over the prior year. We have a uh, little over 124,000 single family residential assessments, a little over 10,000 commercial industrial, roughly 800 multifamily, almost 20,000 ag assessments. The business and personal property division has over 20,000 assessments. And then we've got 944 miscellaneous. And the miscellaneous, uh, part of that, and I'll speak to Supervisor Townsend's comment about the oil wells, we do have oil wells. We have oil and gas production in the county, not very much these days. I think we're down to about a dozen active wells. But we have to, uh, we have to assess those. And so those are something that we have been uh, assessing for quite some time. So the, uh, just a, a graphical pie, pie chart showing the assessed role by type. Um, certainly, you know, it's just a visual indicator that uh, the residential, uh, you know, portion is, is the vast portion of the, of the assessed role. Uh, with the agricultural and commercial coming up second and third there, or third and second as I mentioned them, but, uh, we get into some discussions. We've had some discussions at the board level about water issues, Sigma, uh, and, and how it's going to affect you know, the county if it gets really, really severe, uh, and how the ag, you know, the, it will certainly impact the county. If we lost the ag role completely, we don't know what it will do to the other aspects of it because ag is a driver of all the economy we have. But 
you could see that we could still would struggle, but we could still survive if we lost a significant part of our agro. For a, a period of time, we don't know how long, but we could. Graphical example of what the assessed role has done, starting at this particular chart starts in 1988. Uh, you can see that in 1988-87, we had roughly a $7.5 billion as assessed role, and now we're up at over 36. Uh, Tim has, has pointed out some notes for me indicating that, you know, if you, when you look at that, you're going to see that the tax roll doubles. Uh, what is it, every 15 years? Every 14 years, he says, the tax roll has doubled. That being the case, then uh, looking forward, you might see close to a $60 billion tax roll uh, in about nine, 10 years. So if the stock market has more days like yesterday, maybe, maybe not. We'll see. Completed assessable activity. And so we are event driven in the uh, assessor's office. We, uh, we had uh, roughly uh, 10,700 supplemental uh, actions uh, for 2019. You can see the, the tracking of this uh, peaked in 2017 with our new construction and has dropped down some. Uh, changes in ownership have, have gone up, kind of plateaued, come down a little bit, come back up. Um, a lot of this new construction and the peak in 2017 we did start um, a concerted effort using uh, overtime hours with our appraisal staff to really start getting some of the back load out, and we're, that's what we have seen. We've seen a spike in that because of that effort. Um, and so uh, just in a graphical form, uh, the last five years, new construction, changes in ownership, uh, note that we've added almost $2.8 billion of assessed value over those five years in, the, in these activity sectors. Assessment appeals, you know that you have an assessment appeals board if people do not agree with their assessment uh, and we cannot come to any, any concurrence or agreement in the office. Uh, with the uh, property owner, they may file assessment appeals, and you can see the activity of the assessment appeals. We've almost put them out of business. Uh, going back to the, you know, to the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis, the year of 2008, we had, you know, over 3,800 assessment appeals. It was it was absolutely frantic on that uh, in in that area. Uh, but the way the economy has gone, the way we have structured our uh, our staffing. Uh, we've got it down now. We have some very low uh, low numbers in the assessment appeal. I think uh, Tim was telling me we have like 56 now active active appeals, and that's it. Now this chart will change if we predict that the split roll. We'll talk about the split roll in just a little bit. The split roll happens in the November 20 uh, ballot. We might see this change drastically once again. We may see those assessment appeals really spike because of the commercial industrial activity valuation. One of the key things we, uh, we have here in the county, of course, are ag, ag properties. The Williamson Act plays into it. Uh, we have a very active Williamson Act assessment program. We have over a million acres in, in, under the act. Uh, the Williamson Act valuation, the taxable value for the 2019-20 year was two point, roughly $2.5 billion in taxable value. Uh, please note that we have AB 1265. Now, Supervisor Vanderpool is the only, the only supervisor on the board now that was around when we instituted AB 1265. It happened in 2009 and 10. You were fairly new to the board, sir. Um, AB 1265 was uh, developed by uh, the state state legislator to the state had quit 
sending the counties any subvention funds for the Ag Preserve, as they had done for years and years. Uh, and so when the state pretty much wiped those out of the state budget, there were many counties that were considering opting out, getting out of the Ag Preserve, non-renewing. Uh, one county, Imperial County, actually did it. This county was seriously considering it. We had public hearings. AB 1265 came along. It allowed counties to enact the provisions of that. It lowered uh, the uh, contracts by a little bit, not a lot, but it also gave the counties the ability to actually add a special charge, a special fee to each assessment to defray the subvention, to make up for the subvention funds that were no longer coming in. And, you, and so you'll see now that we're getting a little over $4.1 million in uh, AB 1265 direct charges, uh, which is in excess of what we used to get from the uh, subvention. I don't know if Reed... I, wasn't the subvention 3 .9 like 3.4? 3 3 yeah. 3.3. 3.3. 3 .3. 3 .3. Yeah. yeah. So we are now uh, bringing in more money on 1265, which is paid by the property owners uh, as a special charge on their tax bill. Uh, and so this is the time that I'm going to maybe suggest that you reconsider uh, going back into the, uh, the contract business. I don't think you've issued any contracts for now since maybe 09. It's been a long time. Uh, we get inquiries, I'm sure you probably do from some of your constituents, uh, maybe it's a time to talk to your RMA staff and see, uh, see about, you know, because we're, it's not, you know, I don't want to say it's not a losing deal, but you can see that the 1265 charges are making up for the subvention funds that, that had been taken away by the state. Working over to the clerk recorder side, so we've kind of finished uh, with the, assess, the assessor side. Uh, vital statistics, vital certificates. These are representing the numbers that have been ordered and, and, and issued copies, copies issued by the clerk's office. Uh, so various years uh, in, in, you know, the, uh, the assistant assessor is, is, is a very deep thinking person. And so he, his comments to me were, this is obvious that death is constant and that there may be a relationship between birth and marriages. Huh? That's very astute. <laughs> very astute. <laughs> Birth certificate breakdowns, we're offering this. We've been talking about the homeless issue. Uh, many of the um, uh, birth certificates now are free. Homeless now, I believe, uh, what was it uh, 2019, Tim? It was a, uh, a law change in 2019 allows uh, homeless to get three or more birth certificates a year free of charge. Uh, there are also uh, changes in law that the foster, uh, foster families get free certificates as well. Just an FYI that uh, not all certificates are, are uh, sold at an outrageously high price. What's the charge? Oh, I think it's like $19 for a copy now. Yeah, it's terrible. So much of it is state mandated and, and other fees and other things charged to it. Recorder side, the number of documents per year, you can see uh, going back to 07, we had a peak during the, the, uh, the big upswing in real estate. It's rocked along, it's had some minor bumps and bruises, uh, but fairly constant. Got some notes. Uh, one of the keys is that it wasn't that long ago we came to you for approval of electronic recording. It's been a great success uh, to report to you that um, as of December, the month of December, 61% of our, our uh, documents were e-recorded. It's a great number. Uh, it's a great service to our, to our constituents and it certainly is a great, great deal for the staff uh, as well. One thing I'm gonna mention here with the with, I don't know if anyone is familiar with Senate Bill 2, back in 2018, instituted a $75 charge per recording, uh, an additional fee uh, for the Affordable Housing and Job Act. 
Uh, and so when it first passed, I'm thinking, I don't know how much money that's going to generate. You know, it didn't sound like it was going to be much. Last year, we sent $2.8 million to the state on SB2 money. Imagine what L.A. County must be sending. L.A. County has 2 million parcels. We have 170, 160,000 parcels. Uh, incredible. I'd, I'd like to know uh, how much money that SB2 count has amassed and what they're doing with it. Just a, just a bit of trivia there. Recorded documents by type. You can see that the... Uh, uh, the deeds and transfers are actually less than property liens and releases, and then and then other other kinds. The others might include uh, uh, reconveyances. Um, what is it? Uh, co covenants and restrictions. Uh, solar. What, what were you saying? Solar liens. Solar projects. Now. Yeah. Yeah. And the deed breakdown by area, not too surprising here to see that Visalia, of course, is, gets the lion's share of the, uh, of the activity of recording as well as the unincorporated areas. So challenges going forward. Staffing. Staffing's a big one. We're running at roughly 10% vacancy. I doubt if that's all that different from many of the departments. Uh, but with 27% of our staff being over 50, we're going to have a second round, second wave of retirements after the, the boomer wave. And so um, it presents issues. It presents staffing and logistical administrative uh, problems. We, we've all talked about the millennial issues. We have, we're certainly not immune from that. Uh, unfortunately, the turnover generally always involves the more technical side of it. You train. Uh, we have appraisers, we have certified staff, we have uh, the title and administrative techs that uh, become experts in, in, in um, uh, trusts and, and determining transfers of ownership, and they always have options. And so those are the ones that take a while, certainly, to train, and uh, those are the ones that we hate seeing go, and so we're always working. We hope to be working with HR uh, going forward with um, some reclassifications. Uh, and reorganizations. Mentioned the split role a little earlier. So, very briefly, we don't, we don't want to get too far into the weeds on this. Very briefly, 2017, uh, there was a group of people that got uh, a ballot measure prepared. It was ready to go for the uh, the 2018, uh, November 18 ballot, it was pulled uh, because they were running into a considerable amount of, of headwind, people not necessarily in favor of it. It's a, it, now they're back getting signatures for a second. That's the, the revised initiative portion that you see there, the 19 version. What it's going to do, uh, if it comes to fruition, will separate commercial and industrial properties from Prop 13 protection. And so it would set up the reappraisal, uh, cyclically reappraising commercial and industrial properties instead of applying Prop 13 uh, protection. So it has nothing to do with the Prop 13 ballot measure that's on for March. So don't confuse that. that it, that's just a run-of-the-mill $15 billion school funding thing. Uh, it just happened to have drawn the Prop 13 numbering sequence. So it, a lot of people are thinking that's the Prop 13 bill. It is not. Uh, November of 20 is when we're probably going to see the split roll initiative. Uh, I don't have its, its fancy name. Of course, uh, it has something to do with schools and education and uh, affordable housing and all those catchwords that tend to get uh, put on those ballot measures. Um, split roll impacts. There's uh, the, the new version, the 2017 version, did not have any startup funding. This one provides for startup funding, 
but it's, it, it states that it must be repaid to the state's general fund, although it's nebulous as to who repays it and how. Uh, the 2000, it, it, it provides for some annual funding for administrative costs. Effective dates are a, a, a key issue. Uh, we're predicting significant costs to administer. We currently have four commercial appraisers and a supervisor. Uh, if we are required now to then go around and reappraise all commercial industrial properties, we estimate we're going to need 20 appraisers. We're going to have to kick that up by fourfold because of the, of the sheer volume of the commercial industrial work that would be out there that would have to be done. Uh, so the, um, we feel that there's going to be definitely an increase in assessment appeals because of this. Uh, revenue volatility, we're not sure. Uh, they, they claim that it'll, it'll be uh, less volatile, but we're not sure about that. And it, just a logistical nightmare. Uh, there are so many qualifications and conditions built into this thing that um, it, it's almost we would have to go out and appraise a piece of property to determine whether it falls under the de minimis portion or not. Uh, we don't, we don't have physical space for the people that we're going to need to hire, so that's something we're going to have to work with with the county, is finding, finding desk space for these additional staffing that we have, I, I have to bring up. I suggest we put off the demolition of the main jail facility. You know, it might work. Yeah. Uh, there's a penthouse suite, there's a penthouse office on that building. Perfect for you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Technical advances, always, uh, always part of the issue, especially currently now, we've got an issue going on with a, with a company that we signed on with, what, six years ago. Uh, it seems to be a dumpster fire down in Riverside. Uh, um, not quite as bad in Inyo. They've, they've done something with that same company, but um, not good. We haven't gotten any further, any closer, really, to a to a new system, so that's always a problem. Um, facilities, I mentioned uh, earlier, you know, we, we would love to get out of the courthouse. We thought we had a shot at the old Kmart building, uh, got edged out by, uh, by other priorities. Uh, I can guarantee you Cass and I and everybody would love to uh, have some uh, space out of the courthouse with adequate space for uh, future future needs. So we talked about the property system. We are in the process of con converting from AutoCAD to GIS. We've got staff working with Reed's crew. Uh, RMA have, has been great. We're coordinating work with them. Digital imaging, it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, we've got three full-time staff uh, imaging all documents that come in now. But we have a backlog. We have all the old records, the existing current property records and retired records. We estimate about a million copies need to get scanned. Uh, so we've got to be working and, and doing something with that. We've seen what happens uh, during a, a, a disaster, a catastrophe, portable library, probably the, uh, uh, the documents that were lost in that fire, the, the, uh, that will be, they're just irretrievable. They're, they're gone forever. And uh, um, electronic recording, I mentioned that. We're doing very well with that. Uh, continuing that, hoping to increase that. Uh, gets a little more difficult. The Department of Justice gets a little more uh, uh, particular. All the, uh, all the recording document stations, uh, users have to be uh, cleared and screened by the DOJ. Uh, restructuring, I mentioned something about that, but uh, uh, we hope to be working with HR, CAO, uh, on a variety of things uh, regarding uh, administrative and staffing. Tim, do you have anything? Before I turn to the next Q&A and let you people, I'm standing between you and lunch probably, uh, do you have anything? Did I leave anything out? You want to Sure. I know I did. Do you have any questions?
Any concerns? Um, Incredibly thorough presentation, not as, quite as exciting as I would have expected from <laughs> Roland Hill, but I will turn to my colleague, uh, you know Roger why? Crocker. Because for, uh, there's some new equipment here that even an idiot like me can use. Uh, uh, it's amazing. Remote controls are an old man's ah, best just, friend. I get it, Roland. You know? Go ahead, Supervisor Crocker. <laughs> Thank you, Roland, for uh, the presentation. I think it's it's always a pleasure to have you uh, present to us. So. Uh, and it's always a pleasure being here, sir. Oh, oh, you're just now you're just. I just. On. <laughs> um, I appreciate the fact that you um, verified that the Prop 13 ballot ballot initiative that's on this March ballot is a statewide school bond and not the split roll Correct. decision because you know, there's a lot of confusion. A lot of confusion. I've, I've and, spoken to the you know, two, uh, two rotaries just yeah. within the last uh, month. They all thought that this was the Prop 13 thing. And yeah. so I, I appreciate that. And there's, I think there's individuals have very valid points to be opposed to a statewide school bond. But I think it's just important to recognize what exactly you're voting on. Right. So this is a school bond versus the split roll, which I adamantly oppose the split roll initiative. Um, I, I want to ask about the split roll. If you have seen anything, you mentioned um, there wasn't any talk in there. I've heard there's confusion about ag properties. Um, are those exempt um, from the proposed split roll? Or I'm going to bring, bring TK up because he's much more versed in split roll. But I will point out just yesterday I read an article that was sent out uh, and it's by the state uh, Farm Bureau, right? And you may have seen the same thing. No, th 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 right. they're contending uh, that the State Farm Bureau against the split roll for the fact that that, that it's going to include agricultural, commercially related industrial stuff. Right. Yeah. So like packing houses, exactly. cold storage units, those types would be a part of the split. Roll. Exactly. Is that right, Tim? That is correct. So the language specifically calls out um, commercial growing operations, but it doesn't deal with the actual other end of that, which would be your packing houses and others. So there's some potential it could include that moving forward. Thank you. Um, also, uh, I, j I just want to take the opportunity to, uh, to thank you for your leadership um, in lowering our taxes uh, last year as far as uh, by increasing the the but the de minimis yet yeah and um, I know you didn't include that here but I think that's important to note that um, you've made that effort as well as um, I would be very supportive of looking at expanding and opening up Williamson Act for new contracts as well um, to explore that in the near future I think those are yeah. two great it's things easy to help for us to taxes. say all we do is value it Reed's crew is the one right. we have to process all the Correct. contracts and do all the heavy work. Correct. So he's probably thinking, no, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> Just squirm a little bit. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Mr. CAO. Just a quick question. Well, my, <clears throat> just going back to this split role, I think it's important for people to hear that, is that. So my understanding is there is already a shortage of uh, certified appraisers in the state. So is the State Board of Equalization doing anything about that in case split roll passes? Yeah. None that we're aware of. So unfortunately, the state boards uh, bearing up under the weight of their own organizational issues after they were split off with the Department state of Tax. tax. Yeah. So at this point in time, they're struggling to even find trainers to bring on to get some of the advanced coursework that would permit people to do some evaluation on this. So even if we could bring them on, training them may be a difficulty as we move forward with it. Yeah. Uh, definitely, there will be a shortage of commercial appraisers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? Thank you, Roland. I, that was a, a highly anticipated presentation, and I'm glad that you brought someone wiser than yourself, Tim, who put uh, exactly. together the presentation for his uh, older boss. So that was well, I would have nice. done much better if I had not fallen asleep for the last two hours. Yeah. I apologize. Thank you for coming in. But thank you. But, but, but really, I do appreciate you uh, uh, giving a presentation uh, to the board. I, want, I uh, know one of the things that... Uh, I wanted to make sure we did this year was have every department come before the Board of Supervisors giving an update and talking about some high level we figured, issues. We figured you were to blame. Um, yeah, that's, but uh, I, I just find it to be helpful and uh, I give you a chance to come out of the dungeon every once in a while. I love it. Yeah, thanks. So, thank you. I'll see you at retirement board okay. meeting tomorrow. I thought I heard you weren't going to be there. I will be there.
just because you've uh, uh, gotten me all pumped up now. Um, Thank you, everybody. Next, we will take up item 23, which is a presentation given by the County Administrative Office regarding an update on the 2020 Census Complete Count Outreach. Mr. CAO, do you want to give an introduction or are you? Uh... I'll let you. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, um, Vice Chair, and Board Members, CAO, and Council. Alexander Cruz, Admin Analyst at the County Administrative Office, and I'm here to give you an update on the county's census outreach efforts. For background, on January 29, 2019, your board adopted a resolution to participate in the 2020 Census County opt-in agreement with the state and returned March 26, 2019 to your board to approve the state funding grant agreement. For both the 2000 and 2010 Census, the county utilized TCAG as the lead agency for the formation of the committee and conducting census outreach. For the 2020 census, TCAG was approached by the county again to be the lead agency. On April 9, 2019, an agreement was executed between the county and TCAG to implement the census outreach grant. I would like to introduce to you from TCAG, Barbara Pilligard and Roberto Brady to give you an update on the census outreach efforts. Good afternoon, supervisors. Um, uh, yes, it's, uh, it's been a, a pleasure to, to work with uh, Alex and the CAO uh, on this project. Um, I'll just uh, go through a, a couple of slides and, and, and introduce uh, Barbara. Uh, <clears throat> this slide is, is, from, is a screenshot from the state's uh, hard to count index map. And uh, I'm just showing this so you can see that uh, the, the darker red areas are, have the highest uh, um, hard to count index and they are located all over the valley portion of, of the county. And so the, uh, the outreach that we are doing uh, goes throughout the, the county. And uh, you can see we have a lot of uh, index numbers which are very close to each other. I don't recall the average hard to count index in the state, but these are all much higher than, than that. I put in this uh, slide to uh, emphasize some of the key dates. Uh, it's a little, little lame, uh, but it's, it's my fault I did the slide. In your agenda item, there's a list of key dates, which is more, more informative. But uh, you can see that uh, beginning now in March, there will be uh, waves of, uh, of notices to all populations uh, to participate in, in, the, in the census. Census Day officially is, is, uh, is uh, April 1st, and uh, kind of the basis for the count is where you are living on, on April 1st. Um, and then in, through April, um, there will be uh, uh, reminders. And then um, after April, uh, we evolve into a final stage, which is called non-response follow-up. That's done really by the census. Our, our part is done basically by the by then, although we do do some, some reporting, I believe. And um, this is just uh, also in your agenda item, and uh, uh, there will be three ways to uh, respond to the U.S. Census online, by phone, and by mail. I know that this is the first time that uh, people are able to respond online, and the Census Bureau is, is emphasizing that. Um, and. Uh, uh, phone is, is still available in, as, as said, in, in 13 uh, languages. I'm sorry for choosing the orange color. I think that was part of the California census logo. I thought it'd be clever, but it's a little hard to, to read. Um, wanted to turn it over to Barbara Pilligard now. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Barbara, and she, she worked on census outreach in 2000 and 2010. And uh, 
course, this time around, there's a lot more funding. There's, there's even higher stakes, and, uh, and she's done a tremendous amount of, of, of work. So I'll hand it over to, to Barbara. Sure. With regards to the three options, but is there a push to get everyone to do the online, or is it pretty much equal across? Because I, I heard that there's been a push to try to get people to fill them out online as opposed to phone or hard copy. It, it, my understanding is also there is a push to try to make the, the predominant uh, vehicle the online uh, access to, to the census. And um, Barbara can go into a little more if she likes, but uh, one component is the funding of question ass uh, assistance, uh, questionnaire assistance centers and questionnaire assistant kiosks, which are basically people can come and use a secure uh, internet connection to fill out the, the uh, <coughs> excuse me, the census online. A questionnaire assistance center would include staff to, to help people, but not fill it out for them, but to answer questions and assist them. Okay, thank you. Yes, they are hoping that most people will respond online, but, but people can respond by phone or request it in mail. In fact, uh, they are, the Census Bureau has a couple of different mailing strategies where they feel that there's um, the greater pr uh, probability of online access. They're just sending out a card in the mail and not the paper form. And, and people will have a number that they'll enter in when they go online. Now they said if people get a, end up not getting one of the cards in the mails or have lost their card, threw it out, that they can still go online and enter in their address and be able to take the census. People can also uh, call in by phone and they'll have uh, people there that can assist them with ver in various languages and they can also request a paper form. In some of our county areas, they'll be actually sending a paper form out along with the card, and these are in areas where they have judged that there's less chance of having the um, online access. So, so, so some people in our county will be getting both the card, inviting people to go online, as, as well as the paper form. And if people don't respond, then, they, then they'll all get a paper form. Oh. Um. Oh, this is the fun stuff. So this is the Tulare County Fair. And what we're doing, well, that's, that's, that's me. And we, we did a, a kid's craft project. We have a, a craft sheet, and it has, um, you know, I count, yo, yo cuento, with the um, census logo. And we trace kids' hands. And then we uh, line it with glue, sprinkle it with glitter, and you can see we get a lot of people that come to the table. And while we're working on the project and we're talking with the parents and we're talking with the kids, and sometimes it's really fun. We had a, a, a kid come up to us in Lindsay when we were at Kids Day. And he says, and I asked, have you heard about the census? And he says, oh yeah, I've heard about the census. We talked about it at school. I said, well, what did, what did you find out? Oh, he said, well, it's by, uh, the census. They hear, see, smell, taste, touch. So we had to talk about, <laughs> you know, Different, different kind of census, but uh, no, uh, we've, we've been to as many events as we can, and a whole new, now that it's spring, there are more things to go to. This was out at the, um, a powwow at Tule River Indian Tribe, and I love the way Angel did the glitter, and so you can see how we do it, but it, it attracts the people and their parents to the booth. There's, this is more at the powwow, there's myself, my daughter, all, all my Children have spent time now in the census booth. It's not exactly like Toy Story uh, 3 where it's, you know, in the box, but, uh, but we are, we've been enjoying it. Now this is one of our partners, um, Zadella Hernandez from the Woodlake Family Resource Center. And so she's holding one of the little Know Your Rights cards and of course has a cookie monster out there. So they were doing the Kids Craft Project. We have, we've had many partners working with us who have incorporated census outreach among all their events. And in fact, on the, the Farm Worker Festival that was in Porterville on the 14th, Proteus was out there with census information. At the uh, Black History Month event at uh, Edison, uh, Tulare King's Hispanic Chamber was out there with census information. And then they, uh, Gil called me yesterday and said there was all, uh, the Census Bureau job recruiters were there too. 
Um, we had census cards handed out to the people at the Pixley um, Park, where the middle school was doing their community service day last weekend in the, in the almost rain. <laughs> but I mean, it was a good day. But um, so these little cards, uh, we've printed up now um, about 230,000 of them. And we got them out to, to most of the schools. We've been working closely with the Office of Education. And when Rob Herbert Herman first told me, he says, oh, you better order 150. I thought, oh my goodness, you know, that's a, that's a lot of cards. But we've had to reorder since then. So we had, uh, by, uh, Visalia Unified took about 20,000 cards just in and of themselves. So we've been giving these out. I don't know if you want to, you could tell. We've had other uh, census groups ask for the digital file for these cards. This was something um, sort of modeled after the Know Your Rights immigration cards um, that Civic picks out, which is one of the reasons we have Civic's logo on it, along with Univision and Lubac. So it, we give these out to people, and it, it provides an overview of what kind of questions will be on this census. Um, it tells them how to tell a, a fake enumerator from a real one, where they can call to double check. Talks about how it, the, getting a complete count is important for all the funding programs like Medi-Cal, CHIP, SNAP, the school lunch, school breakfast program, Title I funding for school, Head Start. And so when we've talked to people, they've really connected with that. And these little cards, you could tuck them in their wallet or tuck them in their purse, and we don't find them on the ground later, which is good. But we've been to many events. Uh, Roberto mentioned our questionnaire assistance centers. We're, we have about 51 locations where there'll be questionnaire assistance. Most of them are through, we're partnering with Office of Education. They're, they offer, um, they've set up locations where they're providing a $1,500 stipend so that the school can pay their staff for the extra hours to have the um, center open. And then we're, our funding we're using to, for them to help purchase the tablets or they've got privacy screens or if they've got auto theft, I'm, no, anti-theft, not auto theft, anti-theft devices to help the tablets from not walking off by themselves. So most of them are, we've got uh, locations at various schools throughout the county and then all the Tulare County Library branch libraries and the City of Tulare Public Library. So there's, there, we have lots of locations with that. Um, we've printed up 10,000 census bags that have already gone out. We've given them, to, uh, we've been distributing them through Food, food Link and then all our partners that are that come to the complete count committee meetings and have events, then they'll take the, the bags. So we've had census pencils, and we're working on it. We've uh, just sent to print uh, census children's color books. We'll have crayons. We're partnering with First Five and their 18 agencies to try to get the word out through them. Um, we also have We Support the Census, the Census Supports Us posters, and we've had our partners, we've got about 36 logos uh, on that poster, which was kind of a hard fit, but yeah. it, it was to show, look, you know, these, together. yeah, it affects, it affects the organizations and the community, places that you go every day. So those will be coming out soon. We're working on a, the media component. We've just got the purchase order approved for, uh, with Univision. And then we've got some radio stations uh, at Compostina, uh, Lale, um, KJEG, uh, used to, let's see, used to be uh, La, La, Laser, used to be La Machina, but we're, we're working on our media components. So we're trying to get the rest of the money spent as quickly as we can. We've made, we, um, we did, went through a mini grant process that the TCAG board um, allowed us to develop in September, we received applications, and, and we currently have our draft contracts out for roughly $146,000 working with various agencies. So we're, we're going as fast as we can. Right now, it seems like everything has to be done all at once. But um, any questions? Let me see if I had any more pictures. Oh, this is Lindsay's kid day. Any questions from uh, board members about the census? Board of 
Okay, well, thank you for that presentation, Barbara. Okay. Appreciate uh, all of your effort and making sure that everybody's counted. It's very important. Okay. Okay, now it, that'll take us to item 24. This is a board matter request. This time board members may make a referral to staff to have a matter of business be considered for a future agenda. Any such requests, Supervisor Crocker? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to formalize um, from earlier from Roland's um, presentation. I'd like to um, have some type of discussion, um, look at um, new Williamson Act contracts and what that would look like and the process and have that um, come back before the board. Also, um, something um, that was talked about um, months ago uh, at the NACO annual conference, and I think that um, there's a need is for uh, some type of branding guidelines um, and you know how departments utilize logos and making sure that we have some type of consistency across the board and making sure that we have similar type messaging. I, I know that um, there's a lot of good work going on, but um, having consistency and messaging, I think, helps, um, helps the greater community recognize that we're all one uh, big family. And um, this isn't necessarily a request uh, or, or a request for a future item, but I just think that, um, that we need to have some mechanism to track um, some of these requests. I know that the noise ordinance was brought up in Ivanhoe. Uh, we still haven't seen that. There's been other requests that have come up and just making sure that we're following up and making sure that we are getting these agendized and, and discussing them. Thank you. We do, Mr. Chairman. Items A and B are off calendar. The remainder will be heard in closed session. I do not expect any announcements out, but I do expect Supervisor Shecklian would like to speak. I would like to speak. I have a financial conflict of interest under Government Code Section 87100 regarding closed session item E. I will not attend the closed session for item E and will not obtain or review any non-public information regarding the governmental decision. Uh, clerk, if you, I'm requesting that you make this announcement part of the official record of today's meeting. Thank you. Okay, any, I can eat pizza. Any other uh, typed uh, requests? 